Hello, everyone. Are we uh, are we expecting more commissioners? Marco, this is Gretchen. I thought Ben West was going to join in, but maybe not. Okay, no George, no Pete. No, Pete, I got an email from him today. He's unavailable. Okay. And I hadn't heard from George. He was not in attendance for the planning item at the last meeting. Um, but he didn't say he wasn't available. So, uh, Marco, I'm sorry, I don't know. But I am okay. waiting for Ben. But we do have a quorum. Yes, yes, I see that. Um. We will just uh, give him another minute or so before we jump in. Do you want me to text him real quick and see if I can get a fast response? Sure. Also, Hannah, it's good to see you. There he is, fashionably late. That's his Hollywood look. <laughs> oh, he's driving. Are you driving? I'm driving. Speaking of Hollywood, Sumner, have you ever been told you look like um, Stanley Tucci? It's funny uh, you should mention that. The uh, so two very good friends of ours just mentioned that a week ago. <laughs> Such a handsome <laughs> devil. I'll take I'll take it as a compliment. Okay, any day. You should. <laughs> now I just have to learn to cook as well as he does. Yes. That was a that was a fun show in Italy. That was really good. So should we wait for Ben? Are you? No, no, I'm here listening. Okay. I'm in. All right, cool. Well, everybody ready then? Shall we do it? Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone. Time being 6.03, I call to order the City of Glenwood Springs Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, this is a special meeting tonight. It is May 10th, 2021. And you can join us via Zoom. Let's see here, Web, webinar ID is 883-0411-9503. Uh, there's a passcode, which I've never seen before, but it's 736278. Um, also, if you call in via phone, it is 1253-215-8782. And with that, uh, I'd like to do a roll call, please. Commissioner Dem. Yes. Commissioner Shaver. Commissioner Sipperly. Yes. Commissioner White. Here. Commissioner Schachter. I'm here. And for the record, I want to attest that I have viewed and listened to the entire April 27th planning and zoning meeting, as well as receiving and reviewing all staff supplied materials. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wissing. Here. Commissioner West? Here. Commissioner Waller? All right, excellent. Thank you, Jen. Uh, moving on, item three on the agenda, comments from citizens appearing in front of us for items that are not on the agenda. And I see a hand that has been raised in the attendees list. Um, are you here? to speak or comment on something that is not on the agenda? 
If so, please leave your hand up. If not, if you could lower it, that'd be great. So I know. All right, I'll, I'll uh, let you talk. You're, uh, you're allowed to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Greg Boker. I live at 220 3rd Street in Glenwood Springs. Thank you. And I would just like the commissioners to consider three items. The first of which is, I really would like you to consider when there's a public hearing that you allowed the public to speak at that hearing on the issue under discussion. That did not happen. That did not happen on the April 27th meeting. And there were a lot of people who wanted to say something. Secondly, I wish you would reconsider not the not what you did there. I wish you would look at your code and consider recalculating the parking requirements. I think you have 1.5 off-street parking places per unit. I don't think that necessarily reflects the reality around here. Um, I live near two very small two bedroom homes that are rented out and each one of those homes sports four vehicles apiece. That's more or less twice what your calculations are for your units. I know that's in the code, but I wish you'd look at that and change that to a more realistic number, perhaps up to two anyway for each unit. And finally, just a comment on the lease what is the requirement that a one bedroom apartment only has one car? Two issues with that. First, it's totally unenforceable. So I don't know why it exists. It sounds good. Um, but the second is if the city is not gonna enforce it, if the landowner operates in good faith and tries to enforce it, all that's gonna do is push that second or unallowed car over into third street and impact the rest of the neighborhood. So I think you can do better than just kind of putting words on paper because it really doesn't achieve anything. I thank you for your time and I wish you'd consider those three items. All right, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I have to get a refresher from Jen. Um, were we the final decision-making body or did this go to council? I think <clears throat> if we're talking about uh ben west um application it was actually a something that originally could have been decided by the director um and we had some concerns from the um neighborhood so we kicked it up to planning commission i do think that ultimately the application that was submitted or the final sub submittal would have gone to planning commission anyway and gretchen can you correct me if i am wrong I think the final application um, could have been a director only decision. I don't recall anything in there that would have automatically kicked it to P and Z. So the answer is yes, you would be the deciding body. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, um, yes. <laughs> right, that's okay. That is the answer. Right, and, and at this point, I think we've completed that, right? Yes. All right, um, after we complete something like this and, and the public has more input, what can be done on their end? Well, the decision of um, you folks could, could be appealed. Um, there is an appeal process that's outlined in the code and apologies, I don't have the code section in front of me. Okay. Um, so the parking, the parking issue, that's a, obviously a code amendment, um, much longer process. Much longer process. I completely understand that. So in any event, I guess what we could uh, tell the public, um, if they have more input, they can always uh, go talk to the uh, community development department and file an appeal if, if it goes uh, against their wishes. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, technically, but I do, do believe that that appeal process is uh, seven days following the decision that, that you folks made. So I think um, uh, my math, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but let's take a look. Uh, I think 27, right? 27. Yeah. One, two. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's beyond that. 
All right. Well, again, thank you for your comments. And uh, I guess we'll just have to leave it at that and uh, do better next time. So thank you very much. Uh, anybody else um, here for items that are not on the agenda? Okay, we'll see none. Um, Joy, do you have something to add? I just had a question. Um, the gentleman stated that the comments weren't heard. Was that the case? No, um, I opened the comments at the first hearing, like I always do. And then we, we heard ample comment that night. And then we uh, gave uh, the public, um, was it 10 days, Gretchen, or was it a full month? For uh, additional comments to be sent to the uh, community development department and none came in. Um, and so at that point, I decided to not reopen the public portion of that hearing. So we did hear comments. We did hear a lot of comments and we, uh, we always listened to everybody. So we, we, I think we took them to heart and we did the best we could. So as per code, as, as we are tied, our decisions are tied to the, uh, to the uh, um, 070 building code. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, uh, if I see nothing else, we'll go into our first continued hearing for tonight. And that is planning file 08-21, consideration of an amendment to a development agreement for a minor site architectural plan review for Caverns Village. And this is a continued item from the April 27th meeting. And I think it's, uh, is it Gretchen? Yes, thank okay. you. Please, um, Gretchen. John, if you see Doug Flenty, Richard Nash, or Doug and Julie Pratt in the attendees list, could you promote them? Doug and Richard, can you raise your hand if you are the, the applicants? Perfect. <laughs> Doug Pratt is here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Steve, uh, for the record, Steve Beckley was unable to attend. So um, I'll just I'll just jump in real quick. Um, so just as a reminder, at your April 27 meeting, you took uh, or sorry, you heard staff and applicant presentations and no one from the public was present to comment about the application. Um, I don't have any continued presentation. So I am requesting the staff's recommendation is that, that you all approve the um, requested amendment um, with the findings that are on page three and four of the staff report that was provided in your um, planning packet. And then also with conditions that are on page four of that same planning staff report. And with that, I, like I said, I don't have anything else to add, but I would certainly will take questions if you have them. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Um, I'm just jumping in quick here. No changes to the application, right? No additional information. Correct. And no additional comments from the public. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions to uh, Gretchen at this point? Back to the commission. Please raise your hand. Uh, Commissioner Wissing. Um, Gretchen, just as a point of clarification, I had a member of the public ask me this week, and I'm sorry I didn't go back on the report. There was a change, and are the are the units that Steve's changing with those are those going to be that were going to be long short term rentals? Um, the so I'm not sure that I understand the question, but just to clarify the, um, the units that were to be reclassified as hotel units, i.e. short-term rental, were the four free market residential units. The remaining units were going to remain uh, as affordable. Okay, that's what I understood. Yep. My follow-up question, and this was also from the public person, was they wanted to know, and just for this is 
on the record. Is he going to be held to the short-term VRBO rental standards, mm -hmm. or is there going to be some? No. These so in this property is located in the resort uh, RE zoning zoning district where hotels um, are a permitted use. So these four units are being classified as a hotel unit. Thank you. Just wanted that clarification. Sure. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Schachter, please. You're oh, muted. muted. Sorry about that. Some clarification for the record as, uh, as Amber just did, Gretchen. Um, <laughs> Two couple of things. Number one, um, this is occurring, if I'm understanding, the 15 deed restricted units in the application will not be affected in terms of AMI and deed restriction. Um, this is occurring because as per the interpretation of code, this would continue to allow the project to have four basically free market or hotel units versus a strict interpretation that would limit them to just two. Is that correct? So yeah, you've hit on an actually a, a confusing section of the code in that in commercial zone districts where hotels are, are allowed as are short-term rentals. Um, so this is a mixed use building that does not neatly fit the definition of short-term rental, which is the, at the heart of the issue. Right. It rather fits the definition of a hotel, motel, or lodge as defined in the code. And that is um, actually, it's in my staff report. So unless, I mean, I can read it, that definition if you'd like me to okay but it doesn't change the number of allocation of units in the original application no 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 it's always been 19 total units four. the the issue here is the the four units that were to be that that were described in by the applicant during the the previous approvals and in the development agreement, they were always referenced as four free market units. So the applicant requested to change them to allow for a quote unquote short term, less than 30 day rental, right. which in our estimation fit the definition of hotel motel lodge in our code. And so because it was represented in the, the application in testimony that was taken at the prior meeting um, back in, I forget when this application was, 20, 2020, I guess it was. And then also in the development agreement, we're requiring the applicant to go back through the process to, to amend the development agreement. And based on this, um, going back to the 15 deed restricted units, I don't remember, um, under the prior, under the code, which I think this was approved on, there is no required um, period where they have to be. The applicant still has a right to pay back fee waivers and revert to revert to what in this case, if they chose to, or has the applicant agreed to any particular time under new code pending or voluntarily a, a certain period of time where the units remain deed restricted? So I get a two point so question. Okay, um, so the applicant owner, Steve Beckley, has already signed a, 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 the voluntary so-called deed restriction agreement in which 15 of the 19 units are deed restricted per our code at the time of the approval. So that is the voluntary program. Should he decide to convert the part or all of those 15 units, he would have to pay back right. the system improvement fees that were waived when he signed the agreement. But that could be done at any time at his choosing. At his or choosing. At, or at a change of ownership, right? Uh, yes. 
And did we, did council amend that code subsequent to this application? Yes. Requiring, it's, and what, what, what is a new amendment? Um, Hannah, you might be able to help me if you're on the call um, because the new, the code was amended um, earlier this year. I think it was actually in January. Right. That requires a twenty percent kind of Yeah, yeah, twenty percent of the units um, in twenty uh, percent of residential units are required to be uh, affordable per the um, the uh, uh, Chaffa guidelines, and um, of those, there ten percent. Oh my gosh, I'm getting in the weeds here. It's ten percent have to be employees or 81601ers or something. I'm like here, that. Gretchen. No, oh, thank you, Hannah. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the, just so I'm clear, the inclusionary zoning that passed. Yes. Earlier, you're correct. Yes. That right. council so, recently approved. Yes. And I know the numbers are confusing, but you were very much on the right track. Thank um, you. So 20% is a resident occupied requirement. 10% is um, deed restricted affordability requirement to 100% AMI average. And, and was, there a change, was, there a change, was there a change in the payback period in terms of proration and cost to the developer? Yeah. So that was a change to the voluntary program. Um, uh -huh. So we pushed it out. Uh, this obviously wouldn't apply to Steve Beckley's um, agreement, as Gretchen pointed out, that he signed this before the changes. So his right. agreement is um, what it was at time of the development. The new change... Um, created a period where there's no reduction in the fees owed. And now I'm trying to remember if it was, I believe it was five, five years, years, the first five years of the program, there's no um, amortization that happens. And then years six through 10, it, it's reduced, uh, it goes down 20%. And, um, and then followed by that as a straight line uh, reduction in fees. Okay, so my, my question then leads into this, since the applicant, since we're looking for an amended application, um, subsequent on the one hand, and I think the applicant did refer to the onerous 2010 restrictions, but since we're asking for an amendment and um, can we as a condition, and, and I'd also talk to the applicant, at least um, make a condition that they be subject to the new vesting schedule, not necessarily anything else, that has been adapted since this is now subsequent to the prior approval that kind of helps us ensure, regardless of Mr. Beckley's good intention, uh, change of ownership, help us ensure that it's more likely that those 15 units or more of them are likely to remain um, under the deed restriction program. Can we do that as a condition since we're reconsidering um, the original application? Mm, that's a Good question, Sumner. And my answer is I don't know, other than Steve has already executed the voluntary deed restriction program for the 15 units that were already in effect, that were in effect at the time of his project approval. I, I understand that, but yeah, I, no, I know. Carl, um, yeah, we're, we're, I was gonna say we're I, looking at a new, we're looking at a new consideration. I don't know how it applies in this case. Right. Um I, Help me out with math because I have a law degree. Um, <laughs> uh, Gretchen, are none of the units that they currently have restricted will be converted, will they? Right, that's correct. So they're 19 so, units, and I've got a liberal arts degree, so kind of the same thing. So, so basically my answer is, Sumner, that the units yeah. that are restricted by the prior agreement aren't affected by this application, so the answer is no. Okay, that's all I need. Okay. Thank you. Regardless of what I wish, that's all I need. Thank you. Fair enough. Good question, though. Uh, anything else for Gretchen? No, I see none. Thank you. Uh, would the applicant care to um, comment? Uh, this is Doug, and so thanks for working through all of that. Um, we su we certainly support that decision, but just to also let you know that we uh, we do, we support the recommendation that staff has put together in their staff report and. And uh, you know, have have obviously, you know, this this is not meant to change an original application. It's meant to kind of flesh out a way to have 
rentals the way it was originally anticipated in our original application. It's just that the short term uh, rental program didn't really fit uh, because of the reasons Gretchen mentioned earlier and the hotel lodging does. And so reclassifying those four rooms, which were free market to begin with as hotel lodge rooms um, helps this application kind of meet its original goals when it was presented to the city. So that's my take on it as a planner. All right, excellent. Thank you, Doug. Any questions to the applicant from the commission? No, we'll see none. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, like I said earlier, there, since there was no additional comment, I'm not going to reopen the public portion um, of this hearing, and I'm bringing it back to commission to the commission, and I'm entertaining a motion and planning item 08-21. Uh, Mr. Chairman, regarding uh, planning item 0821, I would move to approve um, the amend amendment to um, change the classification of units to hotel units with the findings on page three and four and conditions on page four of the staff report. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Schachter? A second. And Commissioner Zipperly, second. Uh, any discussion? Raise your hand. If I see none, I'll call for the question. Commissioner Wissing. Approved. Commissioner West. Yes. Commissioner Dim. Yes. Commissioner Sipperly. Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Schachter. Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thanks to the applicant. Thank you guys for coming back um, 10 days or 12 days later. So thanks good, all. Good luck with your project. Have a good night. Um, let's see. New items. Workshop. Workshop. Okay. That was, uh, I guess that was it for official business. Now it's now it's learning time. So um, workshop joint meeting with the DDA. Excellent. Who's here? Shall we bring everybody in? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I will promote folks here. Excellent. Um, Marco. Yeah. Just a, a, a point here. So if anybody is here for planning file 12-21, the appeal, um, that item is being continued. Just to clarify. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, well then, um, do we have to officially continue it? Uh, yes. Well, yes. Well, why don't we, before we jump into the uh, workshop, why don't we do this quick? Uh, okay. Sorry, DDA, just a second. Um, planning file 21, I'm sorry, 1221, appeal of a community development director decision. I'm entertaining a motion to continue this item, Gretchen, till next meeting. Yes, please. Okay, until the... Which is May uh, 25. Oh, our regular meeting on May 25th. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Don't move. I can second. And a second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any discussion on it? No, motion to continue. I'll call for the question. Commissioner West. Yes. Commissioner Jim. Yes. Commissioner Wissing? Yes. Commissioner Sipperly? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Schachter? Yes. Motion passes. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, welcome, DDA. Hello, everybody. Um, it's working tonight. We all have the correct webinar number. Fantastic. Um, how did we want to do this? You guys have a presentation. You want to talk first, and then we'll jump in and discuss what we can do. Um, Marco, if I might, again, sorry, just jump in. Um, yeah. This is intended to be a general discussion with the DDA regarding land use related um, items. Primarily this discussion is, is uh, spurred by the recent um, hear hearings on the A and B Bank, okay. where you all and city council expressed frustration that there were no tools 
in the land use code to preserve yeah. um, downtown retail use. And then there were also some design related uh, concerns, more particularly uh, from certain count, council members that that wanted to see uh, more of a street presence for the, the building uh, front doors. So with that, um, we don't have any particular presentation. This was intended to be kind of a free discussion of ideas to from you, you all to how we could codify um, preservation of downtown retail. And then also I want to mention there was a side, there was a side issue of uh, certain PNZ people that wanted to see um, a requirement of upper floor housing associated with this particular development or multi-story development in general. So with that, I think um, I'm just gonna uh, let you folks uh, chat about the issues and then we'll take notes and, and see how we can best codify your ideas and then come back with you um, at a later date with certain um, potential code revisions to discuss. Okay, excellent. We can do that. And uh, I think we all know what we don't like um, to see. So now let's figure out what we do like and how we're going to get there. So if you guys would uh, raise your hand, if you if you want to chat, that'd be great. And uh, everybody just say what's on your mind. And it looks like we're starting with Commissioner Schachter. Yeah, well, um, thank you. Um, first of all, I wish it were June and we were sitting around a table with a workshop. <laughs> Um, but I'm thrilled to have DDA. I'm, many of us, most of the PNZ would say we don't have enough workshops. And I think um, Charlie Council has kind of noted that we'd like to do that more often. I think Carl knows. Um, and again, I'll reiterate part of what um, Carolyn said. This was a tough one because we didn't have tools. Uh, I mean, what Gretchen said. And, uh, and, and I'd be curious to hear what we don't know the dialogue the DDA is having, but ours was number one, why would there be a bank downtown? But more importantly, why not, why not force them? And they wouldn't, we brought it up, have retail downstairs and your offices upstairs since nobody goes to a bank anyway these days. Um, and it's more consistent. It had to do with setback and entrance. And also some questions how this might spill over to Sixth Street. So what I'm taught, what I'm sharing with you, I think, are concerns of consensus, but also questions because we don't know what DDA is considering, and this would be very helpful to know how all this melds together, both the existing downtown and or Sixth Street um, future development. So thank you. And yes, mixed use residential, we understand that's a problem financially in the state, but to whatever extent we could encourage it, would be also greatly desirable. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Sumner. Laura, please. Uh, thank you. So um, thank you for having the DDA here this evening. So um, just in case I don't know all of you, I'm Laura Kirk. I'm the executive director for the DDA. And we have uh, board members here, Christian Henney, who is our uh, board president, Chad Lee, who I think it's his birthday today and is showing up here for this. So thank you, Chad. He needs to go out and celebrate. So we might get comments from him soon so he can go celebrate, hopefully with people in person. Uh, Lisa Nieslanik from the DDA board, Kurt Carruth, and then um, Councilman Wilman, who is our um, alternate uh, uh, for the council on the DDA board. So um, one, appreciate the DDA board showing up tonight on a Monday night. That's it's great for the discussion. Um, I think that uh, the DDA board and, you know, I, I don't want to put words into people's mouths, but um, we're also concerned about the bank use there. And, um, you know, uh, I think um, if John Zielinski from Treads was here, he would talk about, you know, almost losing, you know, that sort of block to downtown retail. So in a way that you start to shrink um, our downtown area and um, so how do we um, you know continue to grow the downtown area um, and and I think that um, some discussions that um, I've had with Jen and Matt Nunez and Angie with the chamber and others has been um, how can we approach this in 
in two ways. One, you know, um, from the code and things like that, but also how can we approach this in a kind of a proactive way to um, go out and try to attract the kinds of businesses that we want in the, in the downtown for our underutilized spaces. So that um, working at it both from uh, the code side, but also um, recognizing that when people buy properties, there are certain uses attached with that. And so how can we, from the economic development uh, perspective, identify types of um, entities that we want downtown, um, how those might work together, and then trying to uh, come up with packages, meet with people, facilitate uh, discussions when we know that buildings are um, coming up for lease or vacated or underutilized to try to draw in the kinds of um, activities that uh, create vibrancy in the downtown. Excellent. Be before I let uh, uh, Chad talk, I, I was just <clears throat> thinking driving down the, the street today, um, the, the bank across the street is almost a spitting image of what we're getting. It's a parking lot with a bank in it. Now, the, the tragedy with, with A and B was is that we lost retail. We're across the street. It was, I think it was one shop that went away. The Wasn't it a kayak or something shop for canoe for a long time? And then the bank on the corner. So they just replaced the bank with the bank. But in any event, if we had something in place, we could have created more retail there as well. So just a, a thought. And Chad, please, your hands up. Hey, thanks guys uh, for having us. I think this is great. And I echo Sumner's um, uh, comments that it'd be great to be in person around a round table and maybe we can do this again soon. Um, I, I'm obviously in a weird position. I represented A and B throughout that appeal. Um, so I'm intimately familiar with the, the sideboards of, of, of PNZ's authority and how we got to where we did. Um, so I'm not gonna comment on that specifically. Um, but I will tell you that, that we, the DDA, um, is focused on how do we increase vibrancy downtown. We understand and appreciate that small retail is the lifeblood and the character of Glenwood Springs, and, and we look to encourage that. Um, economic development is one of our um, strong points. We look to uh, you know, ways we can, we can do that and ways we can work with the city. Um, as far as our role, obviously our role is different than uh, the Planning Commission's role. You're a quasi-judiciary body, um, you write code, um, and apply it. Um, I think that we are we are open to uh, more specific downtown design standards. We'd love to comment on that. I think uh, we've got some special expertise in that regard, and certainly our executive director. Um, you know, we'd look to potentially talk to Jen about you know how do we find those uh, businesses uh, to create vibrancy downtown. How do we target them and get them in there? Um, I, I do have a question for for staff. There were several sort of um, code tweaks thrown out in this memo, and and I like some of them. I, my question is, uh, do these things work elsewhere? Um, do we have the type of, um, you know, are, are they going to work in, uh, do we have the critical mass in Glenwood Springs for these things to work? Um, my, as, as a land use attorney, um, I would certainly wouldn't want to chill development uh, by implementing um, too specific of regulations that it just doesn't work for any, anybody and they go a couple blocks off. So uh, I guess that's, those are my comments and my questions to staff. Thank you, Chad. Um, any answers from staff at this point or should we just keep going with uh, commissioners and members? Um, Marco, this is Gretchen. Yeah. Just a, a real quick uh, answer to Chad's question is that that we put put together just some quick bullet points um, of ideas I think that were in um, codes from other jurisdictions, and it was only meant to um, get your um, uh, your creative ideas flowing. Uh, it it they weren't actually um, intended necessarily for Glenwood specific. Uh, so that's that's my answer. And Jen, uh, unless you've got any, because uh, you helped put together that list. 
I think it was just intended, as you said, to kind of give some ideas of things. Um, I do think that uh, staff would be concerned about the chilling effect because I think you could say, well, they're, you know, you have to do X. And then if you can't do X, then you're going to have people who have buildings that are vacant. Um, So, uh, but again, we just wanted to throw out some ideas of things that maybe could be an idea of how to move forward. Um, But I, I, um, I always think that a carrot is a good idea um, because there are places that, you know, Telluride is an example where they, you know, they have a very strict interpretation of the code. And so it, people have this idea that they don't have any chains in Telluride. And it, I guess is not true. Um, so, you know, there is a way to do it. That's just the kind of code strict enforcement kind of method. Um, but again, these are just ideas. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schachter. Um, thank you. A couple things. You know, when I when I look around and, and, and you can't compare, it's not apples to apples, but one of the places, and even though they're twice as large as we are, I always turn toward Durango. Um, and yes, they did a by, bypass and we didn't. But the vibrancy of that downtown, any time of the year I've been there and the amount of retail and restaurants that are mixed or open always impresses, impresses me. Yes, they're twice as large, approximately as Glenwood. But I'm wondering, both from an economic development point of view, which, uh, and as well as a zoning point of view, are there some things to be learned from Durango and their code? And then on a smaller scale, I even look at Ridgeway that has a tiny downtown compared to ours, and they have a highway running through it with commuters. Again, not to the extent of our 82, but even that on a smaller scale, maybe it's a compactness, I don't know, but their side streets and main streets, again, seem vibrant. So I'm wondering what DDA has looked at, who, what models they've looked at as far as what's working can work in Glenwood. And then regarding the code changes, um, one thing might be to consider if together we can all come up with desirable code changes that would make downtown look the way we hope it would be, and, and I assume this spills over to 6th Street, rather than perhaps consider, rather than being so restrictive that it keeps people from developing, to look at, with the guidance of our attorney, of course, look at perhaps a menu of options like we've done with our variances that say, hey, yeah, there are a couple absolutes. You've got to have X amount of retail on the street front and you've got to have certain design standards, but in terms of the other things, maybe you have to hit two out of four, three out of five desirable elements that that, that might be both carrot and stick. Those are just some thoughts. Thank you, Sumner. It'd be, it'd be also nice to know if uh, what the tourist numbers are from uh, Durango to Glenwood comparatively and see if the population increase or decrease makes a difference in that. I don't, I don't even know. But anyway, Commissioner White, please. Just from an economic standpoint, I know we talk about um, attainable housing for residential units. Is there any sort of commercial module that incentivizes um, commercial owners to I don't know, just keep more, keep rents affordable for these smaller businesses. Cause I know I've run into that just on the real estate front, um, you know, where business owners are struggling to um, keep their doors open. And then you have something like COVID or um, the bridge project come through and it just wipes them out. And so is there some sort of commercial module that is kind of that carrot like Jen um, mentioned that can be implemented. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't, I do not know about, I, I would imagine that maybe, um, Charlie could jump in and see if, if council, I mean, numbers are you guys' game at some point, you know, so, uh, but before that, uh, Commissioner Zipperly, please. My comment was basically about, I had to look up what formula businesses are, and I'm glad I did. Uh, I saw that that was in some other 
codes in, um, so a formula business is like a chain, basically like Subway or Starbucks or something. Um, I would like to consider uh, limiting those in our, our downtown. And um, one comment about A and B, and it kind of ties in with the Comcast building across the street. Like we've truncated our Grand Ave. Like there's no reason to go up there. You can see there's nothing else up there. And uh, I think these are the things that we're um, trying to address here. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Charlie, you wanna, you wanna say something about numbers? Is there any incentives we can give? Um, that's gonna, Janet have to, or Carl have to weigh in on more on whether it's incentives, I, whether the council would be willing to give incentives, I think the right package was put together, I would suspect they would. You know, I know they're real concerned about losing affordable, as Joy put it, affordable retail space. Um, I think that some of comments about Sixth Street will well place because uh, we hope to develop Sixth Street and get it constructed by next year. They, the streetscape improvements anyway, and we suspect, at least I do, I can only speak for myself, that that will drive the development on Sixth Street, much like the uh, improvements on Seventh Street drove the development of Seventh Street. And then as it turns out, the bridge and under the bridge and all those areas. So um, we think it's real important that we get this stuff in place uh, because as that property redevelops, uh, <clears throat> we wanna make sure we get the right mix of, of businesses. I can see Sixth Street is becoming a very viable extension of the existing downtown area um, as we try to capture those uh, visitors that are coming from most of those West Cliffwood motels. Um, I guess that's my comments. I, I'll be happy to answer any other questions, Marco, but kind of my thoughts. Excellent, thank you. I, I was just thinking, I've never heard of a, I've never heard of a, a, a bigger program for um, a, affordable commercial spaces. So I would think it would be more on a local level um, that maybe the city could help out with, like you said, improvements or fee waivers or whatever else we can come up with. But uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think Sumner was first. So Commissioner Schachter, please. Well, related to um, Joy's question and what you just said, and me, Charlie, Carl, Jim, is there, is there any um, program we're aware of, of a commercial deed restriction, like Joy said, that maybe ties in sales tax collections, fee waivers with with um, commercial or retail rent um, rent limits. I don't know, but that would be a way to deal with it. As Marco said, on the local basis, I don't know legally or whether there's any model out there that exists. Yeah, let me jump in. I you know I think it'd be very hard um, with the state of the law in Colorado to do some kind of a, uh, you know, a rent restriction on commercial. Um, I do think there are some opportunities potentially because obviously the DDA has a, a pretty good revenue stream um, available to it that you, you know, we can do packages with both the property tax and the, the sales tax on individual development proposals, which is probably the biggest carrot that we have to offer. Um, and potentially some some city sales tax incentives there too. I think the tough part is is that in those small downtown, um, you know, formatted shops, those numbers don't add up to the big numbers they do. Like when we do a, 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 a you know a TIF deal on a on a large commercial development, just because you don't have you're not generating that much, right? Comparatively speaking. I think the other, so absolutely those are available to work with people on that or on, um, you know, fee waivers and things like that. I think all of those things are on the table. Um, I think the hard thing is balancing this kind of the, the cost of rent in the downtown core versus the kinds of businesses that you want to have be there. Um, unfortunately, a lot of small retail can't pay what a real estate office can or a bank can or a law firm can to be in that space. And that's part of the struggle, I think, is that differentiation and um, between what landlords are asking in rent and what they can get um, versus what those kinds of uses can actually generate for them. And I think that's the, I think that's a little bit of the disconnect. So we can certainly try to help. 
Um, and I think, um, you know, there are things that you see in other communities, um, you know, the Aspen or the Tellurides of the world, you know, one of the, the tools they use are limitations of, of chain retail. Historically, I would not say that would have been a problem, but now that we have crossed the $800,000 average home price in Glenwood Springs, I imagine that you're going to see a lot more Aspen style brand name shops potentially popping up in Glenwood because you have to be in a particular income bracket anymore to live here. And that's who those shops cater to. So that might be something we could look at uh, as well as a way to try to encourage that kind of small town, you know, not small town, but kind of that classic Glenwood retail. Um, I, I don't have any great solutions and, and Jen texted me and said, you know, come up with some solutions. Um, <laughs> I I, uh, I really like to hear what all you guys want, and then I can kind of go back and see what's in the tool bag to use. Um, so that's kind of what I was hoping to get out of tonight is to really get a clear idea of what you want to create, and then um, I can I can you know on my side of things I can really think about what I've done in other communities as well as in Glenwood and see what we can do to to make that happen. I think if I may, Chairman, that just to follow up what yeah. Carl said critical whether we can do it tonight or who does it but I'm going to carry over Hannah's hold this talk on the housing commission decide what you want and then try and figure out how much of it you can do so the first thing is and and we're we're I think we're beginning to focus on it what do we want downtown to look like what do we want there and then let Carl and the others figure out what we can codify or incent to get it done so what do we want is the first step. So, so just quick, do we have a restriction on national chains at this point downtown? We don't have anything like that. Okay. And if I could just jump in, I don't think Telluride does either. I think it's a, kind of like a, a rumor that that's how they manage okay. it, that it, they actually manage it through the design standards. Very, very strict enforcement of the design standards is my understanding from reading an article because I always thought they had one too. <laughs> yeah, so you can't have a red chili popping up in neon on the side of the building. I got it. I understand. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. Uh, Laura, please. Um, you know, I, I was going to just on, on the incentive kind of um, conversation, I think an important thing for us to keep in mind is we have those continued discussions is um, the, the equity question. And so making sure that um, whatever we do going forward um, is fair to the existing businesses that are here, um, because that's certainly something that we'll, we'll hear. Um, you know, I think uh, one tool that the DDA has, um, we have a facade grant program right now that's a $5,000 match for facade improvements. Um, anyone doing facade improvements in the downtown right now is spending um, much more than that, you know, 30 to 50,000 ish uh, for facade, facade improvements. That might be something uh, that the DDA board considers is upping that match, um, you know, in, in that that helps, um, you know, a, a new kind of entity um, come into the downtown, getting facade improvements that are um, add to the character of the downtown, I think improves uh, the quality of the, of the downtown core for everyone. So um, it might be an easier sort of equity conversation with other existing businesses. Um, I, I, and then kind of going back to what we want downtown, I would go back to what Chad mentioned in his initial comments is, you know, I think like others, we want vibrancy in the downtown. We want uh, retail and restaurants. And, um, and honestly, you know, when we look at uh, this summer beginning in August, uh, the Rocky Mountaineer train is gonna be coming through town, which is this high-end tourist train. And we probably don't have enough restaurants to serve those needs coming forward. Um, I think also, you know, there is some, um, I don't know if urgency is the right word to this, but as um, others have mentioned, um, you know, we are looking, hoping that there's going to be some redevelopment on 6th Street over the next several years. Um, Ken's business has moved out on Cooper and um, 
you know, so I think having some ideas of things that we want to have happen in these locations is important um, as these redevelopment opportunities start to come forth. Thank you. So, so that said, I mean, vibrancy, and I'm just throwing this out there, would it be so bad to have a national chain move in somewhere and, and maybe liven up an area and have little shops left and right jump on that wagon, having that traffic from the national chain? I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. I mean, any, anybody that can afford the rent might be not so bad to have downtown. I think combined with those design standard restrictions, right. that would make sense. They, they have to look the way we want them to look. They can run their business the way they, any way they want, but it has to look the way we want downtown to look. Right. Uh, Christian, please. Thank you. First off, I appreciate you guys meeting with us tonight. And uh, I think this is a good conversation. Um, I'd like to uh, carry on a little bit on what Carl started talking about. Um, and that is, you know, we really do want to have vibrancy and vibrancy means activity. Activity needs, you know, retail, restaurants, bars, activity on ground level. And uh, of course, the professional services can pay higher rents, but you know, I would hope we would find a way in the downtown core that uh, have them on the upper floors of the buildings and where the general public and the tourists and the residents of our town are walking in and spending their sales tax dollars are on a great storefront. And uh, along with that, we should have better design standards or improved design standards. But let's not f uh, forget what makes a, a town like Glenwood special is the eclectic style of the different buildings, that it's not just a rubber stamp of one style of building has to be repeated everywhere. You know, we should encourage the mix um, because that those different architecture styles is what makes the downtown have a unique feel, um, you know, like's been mentioned tonight, Durango and, and these other towns. I mean, there's just great mixes of businesses. Um, obviously a big incentive in what we're after and what we've talked about at our DDA meetings is, you know, we've got to keep that uh, sales tax base to support uh, uh, the DDA, to support the city, to support the services for the city. And, you know, keeping that space, you know, storefronts should face the street, shouldn't face parking lots at the side. Um, realize you guys didn't have the tools in your toolbox. And, you know, we're hoping to just have good dialogue with you on, um, on some ideas of how we can uh, fix this and improve. So hopefully that helps the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Christian. And just to throw one out there, I think if you take out storefronts, you should replace them um, at least up to 75 percent, 50 to 75 percent. Um, and, and that's just a start. Um, and also we need to talk about surface parking lots, but that's a that's a different. Maybe that comes in a little later. Um, Commissioner Schachter. Well, again, I think Christian raised a good point that I think reflects the bias of all of us is how can we legally and with equity restrict professional services, get them off the ground level. I think that's critical for Carl to find a way how to do that um, from what I'm hearing um, and critical to part of our vibrancy. I don't recall what happened with the design standard idea of in certain parts of the core raising the height limits with setbacks to possibly encourage more mixed use residential. Um, that was something that discussed a long time ago. I don't know where that's gone, whether it's dead in the water or just got put on the back burner or ever got into code. Um, that, was, ever that, was another, that was another thing. And the other thing, um, Laura, we're gonna get into politics here. You mentioned equity. In this day and age, political age, I also think of um, social and economic equity. And we have so little representation downtown of our Latino population. Um, and I don't mean just another Latino restaurant in terms of retail you know, and, and other things. And, and where does that fit into the long-term picture? And that's a rhetorical question at this point. Thank you. And 
Charlie, please. Yeah, I'm just, you know, government moves at glacial speeds <clears throat> and sometimes that's fast. Um, but I, I really think that, you know, I know that the mayor and I have had these discussions between us and that is that we need this group, the PNZ in particular, the DDA, uh, giving you assistance from a downtown perspective to move forward with these kind of things. And I know you guys spend a lot of time and I appreciate all the time you guys do spend in meetings, but to get into meetings that aren't just reviewing applications and plan requests, I think it's gonna be helpful to move in the dialogue. And I don't know how you do that within meeting once a month and, and I'm not asking you to devote the rest of your life to city stuff like some of us in council do, but I, you know, if there's some way to, you can begin to move that dial forward and, and as you all know, we're going to hopefully start the comp plan here at the end of the summer or by the end of the summer, at least that's the whole, you know, discussion we had this morning um, that we hope it's going to get started by then. And that's going to be a big project for you guys to be working on. So we don't want to lose sight of, of how to get these improvements to um, the design of the downtown and to activate the downtown area. We don't want to wait too long. Um, and then you give it to us, we'll, we'll take forever. So I'm not kidding. I, I think if you get it to us, I think the council knows this is a big issue. and They'll begin to move on it quickly. Well, thanks, Charlie. I think uh, um, most of us in the commission, and again, I'm not, I'm not speaking for you guys, but um, I have been asking for workshops for mm, three, four, five years now. I think I've been in everybody's ears about it, and I know we've been busy with uh, all kinds of things and the code revision and all kinds of whatever else came along and then COVID hit and then everything slowed down a little bit. But um, I think most of us would love to have uh, a second night, uh, a month workshop like we used to have uh, way back when, and Carl probably remembers those, way back when, that was a while ago. Um, I'd love to pick that back up and, and just iron out specifics right there, right then and, and move it along. Um, I have, I'm fully committed to that, so. Uh, Commissioner Schachter. Thank you. Um, as Hannah knows, I tend to be an impatient person. Um, what I hear Charlie asking for is possibly accelerating action items. And my suggestion, even possibly before, um, Marco, we have another workshop, is that we, we take this momentum, and perhaps that you and Christian, are you the chair of the DDA now? That, that the two of you, and again, we route it through staff so we don't have meetings, ask your respective commissions for the ideas that we've talked about. What are your top ideas that you would like to see in the downtown district? Submit them to staff so we don't have a meeting. And then staff can say, okay, here are the overlapping suggestions, maybe three, four, five of them, at least as a beginning, saying, okay, now throw them to Carl and to Jen, say, hey, these seem to be overlapping priorities. This is just the beginning of the story. How can they be implemented? And we're not waiting around. And then that goes to council. We're not, you know, we can have another workshop, but we're not waiting around a month or two or three to schedule a workshop. We're heading toward action items that can land on council's desk with consensus from the two commissions and with um, legal telling us how to do it. Um, so that would be my suggestion to, for an action item right off tonight. I think that's a that's a start. Um, I just would like to throw out there that um, our regular meeting is at the end of the month. Uh, there's three other weeks. Uh, if we space them every other week, we could easily have a second night every month where we can have a workshop and talk about these things. Well, I, I'm not denying the workshop at all. I think with with this, with DDA and other commissions, that would be, and with council, that'd be critical. But in the meantime, we can take some action, but I, I hope we do workshops also. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Summer. Uh, Commissioner White. I think you- Sorry, trying, locating my mute button. Um, Laura, you talked about those, those facelift incentives that, that you have. Is there a way to um, create more vibrancy and just kind of variety of the shops that come in by 
creating, you know, a grant for somebody to come in and put in a particular type of shop. And I know that's not really equitable, but if we're trying to incentivize this eclectic feel, um, say we identify what kind of shop fits that. And if uh, an entrepreneur wants to come to town and, and maybe venture in that way, could we incentivize the variety that way by providing um, grants for facelifts or, or for build outs on new shops? Um, I think we'd have to talk about that with the city and some of the legal minds would have to weigh in on that. Um, I think it's one thing for the DDA to participate in facade grants and improvements to the exterior of the building. I don't know about, um, I, I just don't know this. So it's a question of, you know, our ability to, um, you know, grant incentives for certain kinds of interior modifications or certain types of entities. So that that's just something I need more information on or Jen or Carl or Chad might have some feedback on that or Charlie, so. Yeah, I, I think that- um, Oh, Carl, please. Depending on how it's structured, we, we absolutely could. Um, um, you know, the good thing about money is that it's fungible. So you can usually find a way to, to make it fit into the right box, I guess. And I think that's really a, um, a kind of um, proposal specific sort of conversation um, on what works. I would be uncomfortable with just saying, yeah, we'll do interior grants to X amount, but as part of a um, an economic incentive package for a particular development or redevelopment of a property, I think we can look at some fairly creative things that can be done um, with, you know, with that TIF money on that relates to that property specifically um, is oftentimes one of the best one of the best incentives um, is is you know kind of a share back on some of that um, based on specific goals that that um, that, that uh, development or redevelopment is going to meet and you see programs where a DDA has said okay we really want restaurants so they maybe have a facade grant but they fund way more if it is, what they're looking for, which is a restaurant. So, um, and then I would just say, we do have a revolving loan fund that we got some money from the USDA for, and we have um, just given out the first um, one of those um, loans, low interest loans. And, uh, but it was intended to, to help kind of those types of businesses with some of those expenses, um, but it is a loan. And I know there are lots of businesses right now that don't want to have, you know, any more loans. The other thing that we do have on the books is a sales tax rebate incentive, which is complicated. So I won't go into it, but it's essentially for, um, it incentivizes local labor and it also incentivizes sales tax because it's a sales tax rebate and it goes to kind of offset the building uh, fees or the system improvement fees. Um, but it is complicated to go into all the, the details of it uh, in the short you know time I have to explain it. <laughs> but we do have some things that are on the books that are kind of in this vein already. Right. And to just follow up on that, um, the probably the, the places where that incentive package works the best are if you're say converting a space that was previously not a restaurant to a restaurant because it's gonna have the biggest hit on system improvement fees, which is one of the areas that we can help out on. Um, so that's where I was saying like it, it just really, um, part of it is just kind of communicating with the business community about that there are, there are things available as you're thinking about where to take your business to next. And you know I think it's interesting to see the number of kind of mid valley restaurants that have drifted to Glenwood and stayed here, right? Um, there's other new mid valley stuff that has gone in, but when you think about some of those um, smoke, um, uh, Mings, uh, there's a number of them that have moved into because they like being in downtown um, Glenwood. 
So I think there's real opportunities to recruit and develop there too. And I think it goes to what Jen was saying about, you know, picking, you know, as we move away from design standards and then starting to pick and incentivize or recruit specific businesses is from the DEA's perspective, what is it that are the downtown needs um, to increase that vibrancy and then really targeting those you know, those types of businesses or even specific businesses that are maybe located in, you know, in other places that it seems like it would be a great fit. Great, thank you. Uh, Chad, please. Yep, uh, great discussion. And I'm certainly in favor of um, providing incentives and even a, a tiered level of incentives targeting those specific uh, businesses that we deem vibrant. Uh, versus those that aren't like law offices. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, and I wanna go back to Sumner's suggestion. I think it's a great one. Um, let's get our chairs talking. Let's, let's uh, within our own uh, commissions, um, come up with a priority list and some ideas of how we can work together to achieve those specific goals. I do want to remind uh, the planning commission that we, we just revamped our plan of development that's essentially our comp plan. It describes our priorities um, in a general way um, and some, some, some ways to execute those. Uh, so I'd encourage the planning commission to take a look at that. Um, and, that's, um, and then let's come together and find some specific ways to achieve that. Um, one final comment. Historically, the DDA has been uh, focused really on placemaking. Uh, most of our budget went towards infrastructure downtown in, in sort of a build it and they will come um, theory. And I think that has worked. Um, our budget has taken a big hit in the past couple of years, unfortunately. Uh, and so we've, and even before that, we've discussed pivoting more towards um, economic development and what we can do in that vein, you know, throwing events downtown, how do we recruit businesses to fill those spaces? So uh, it's on the top of our mind um, for sure. So Sumner, I think that's a good idea. And Chad, is, are your priorities and the, the new kind of vision you talked about, is that on your website? Uh, it should be, Laura. And I just, Laura, if you could just maybe email them our, our most recent plan or Jen, that might be a good way to go about it. It is on the website. But um, I'll make sure that uh, Jen has that or I'll make sure that Gretchen has it and gets it out to the planning commission. That'd be great, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lisa, please. Hi, everyone. Um, great discussion. Uh, I, I agree with what's being said tonight and i um, excited about it. And I would just suggest as we move forward um, for what we do want downtown. Um, I do think music, art, um, and representative communities, the Latino um, culture, bringing that in downtown. And I don't know how we do that. If we have a little few more green spaces or a few more food carts or areas for, um, music or events, um, that families want to come to. If we get those in between businesses to bring more people downtown, I think that would be, um, fun and exciting and, uh, just bring more people in. I think that's a, a great approach. Um, but that said, and I don't want to complicate things, but um, sh should other commissions be part of this discussion, such as the Art Council or what, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what we call it, or the uh, Transportation Committee? I mean, should we, should we talk to um, other commissions to see if everybody has uh, input on this? Or is that too complicated in the end? Um, uh, Amber, please. I have a simple question, I think. Do, is there any money allocated to, for events? For example, if a, is there grants available or if, if some entity wanted to do a downtown event, is that part of what you guys are funding right now? Um, generally right now, the DDA um, kind of supports um, events, but we don't, we don't, we're not leading them that there's um, 
Pat Miller um, is with the city of Glenwood Springs and he is the um, event coordinator. And so uh, I don't think we're gonna have a big 4th of July this year, but I think maybe a bigger New Year's um, celebration, but he, he would be in charge of those and then working with um, the DDA and um, others, uh, you know, to make sure that we have the appropriate impact. I think one thing we have heard just not to digress too much, but um, many of the businesses uh, through COVID have said how much they appreciate smaller events rather than the big events. That the smaller events bring uh, sort of a more consistent uh, type of business and the really big events um, actually tend to um, create um, instances where the businesses sometimes even lose a little bit of uh, activity. So that's just something to keep in, in mind as we go forward. Um, one other thing I wanted to add yeah. through, um, sorry, uh, through COVID, I think we've also learned um, the value of um, outdoor dining and the vibrancy that that brings to the downtown. So I think as we um, continue to have these discussions talking about um, what kinds of outdoor spaces work uh, within the code and um, you know, making sure that we have ADA accessibility on the sidewalks and things like that still. But, but I do think that that um, vibrancy has been something that has been good for the downtown and um, might be something that we want to um, encourage going forward. I was going to add, Jen, Jen, you might be able to tell me for sure, but do we have like last year, as I remember, about $100,000 in the parks budget for event planning. That's part of what Pat Miller manages. Do I remember that number correctly? I think so, but I, I don't know I what budget. we ended up with this year. Um, but I do know that there is a there are plans, but we've been cautious and <laughs> uh, to because we didn't know what was going to be happening kind of with the pandemic. But I, I think, you know, even in the pandemic, we did the, um, the fireworks at the New Year's. And so I know that that was something that we wanted to continue. So that um, is kind of evolving into one of those bigger events. <laughs> the reason I sort of ask is, I know some people and COVID exception. So let's just all pretend like this isn't a COVID year. But um, people who have asked me and said, hey, we want to bring a kayaking event or we want to bring this and bring it to to the city and I just want to be sure that I can give good coaching on there may be some help with coordination there may be some help with some money depending so I Amber have them reach out to Pat Miller in the parks department Unless, Jen I'm sorry I, I was just going to say I don't know that we've really done too much in the way of helping other events um, do to put on their events, um, some coordination, um, obviously strawberry days is kind of a different, uh, sort of situation. I think, um, you know, we do help folks through the process, you know, if you want to do a pancake breakfast or those kinds of things, but I don't know that we have really done incentives for events, um, with the exception of during the Grand Avenue bridge that we did, those events that um, Emily Arandondo put on were primarily um, some more supported by the city. All right, thank you. Commissioner Schachter. Um, two things, Marco, regarding the other commissions, there's clearly overlap, I think, with whatever arts we have going on and with parking, I know that's a big issue and downtown paid parking covers DDA and transportation. What I'd suggest perhaps so we don't get too bottlenecked is like, if you're willing to work these two commissions to get stuff priorities as fast as possible, see where, where they overlap. And let's say there's three, four, five things, and then get that out to the other commissions for additional comment rather than opening it up too broad and getting less done. That'd be one thought. And then a question of Laura, Charlie and others, I mean, for years, I've been wondered why 
particularly with our new bridge, why we don't, why somebody hasn't come up, for example, with a plain air event in downtown on our new bridge, which I, those events are so successful in other communities in drawing arts and participants and also fundraising in many cases. And, you know, you mentioned kayaking, we now have opportunities for mountain biking. So it's not so much that we subsidize them, Jen, or anything, but what makes sense in terms of making sure that people know, that organizations know the resources and reception is there? Who do they talk to? I mean, who puts that out? Would Pat do that saying, hey, if you're a bike organization, come talk to us about a mountain bike. We have great new trails. Come talk to us about a mountain bike event. If you're an arts council, come talk to us about a plein air event. How do we how do we promote that without subsidizing it? And and have we done that? Uh, good thoughts, Sumner. Um, uh, let's see, Commissioner uh, White, I think was next. Um, I think Lisa mentioned food trucks and I think um, I'd love to see like a food truck Friday and is a really natural place for that to happen in my brain would be um, 6th Street. There's all that parking there. And I feel like, and again, who does this, right? <laughs> is it Pat? Um, but I think that that would be a really easy way to bring vibrancy to that area without having to, um, you know, recondition these shops. Very good idea. Sp speaking of food truck, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, name any names, but, and I don't know if the DDA can help with this, but I, I was downtown Thursday night and, uh, Around seven o'clock, I kind of felt like I should eat something. So I walk around downtown and the food truck closed down before seven o'clock. And the pizza place around the corner had no single slices left. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, wait a minute, guys, we're, we're trying to do vibrancy here, but we allow businesses to shut down early. Why? Shouldn't there be a, hey, don't you want to make a few extra hundred dollars and stay open? On a Thursday night, I'm not saying on a Monday night, but on a Thursday night. So I had to go home and eat. Anyway, uh, Commissioner Wissing. I just was gonna add a small comment to Sumner's um, comment was, uh, so I, my brother-in-law picked up, we picked up the last four years of the tri and Triathlon. That was a 30 year event. And it was a bitch to get through the planning and so i i think that maybe we've developed a little bit of a reputation that's like events are too hard to do in glenwood even if you're a 30-year event that's gotten grandfathered through every process and so to sumner's maybe point or not i think that we might need to do a little bit of outreach and a little bit of that says hey we're we have a person we're event friendly come back and try again um because i can tell you for the past 15 years, I've been telling people, don't bother. It's a fucking disaster. Oh, sorry. It's a real challenge to get an event through through this, the process of the city of Glenwood. So I just wanted to add that as we might need to tr consider that. So, so just to clarify, uh, Amber, the, the trouble or the difficulties were with the city? Yes permitting process to get through the, the the police force that allows like they wouldn't let you close certain streets even though you close them for every t every time the past 27 years it was just an uphill battle okay and i think that maybe people maybe and i know multiple people have asked me like hey amber how do we do an event and i'm like i wouldn't do it here we put on the strawberry shortcut and it was very similar very interesting to hear. Um, Laura, please. Um, I was just on, I think, something that uh, the DDA has been um, very interested in is trying to work on getting businesses to expand their hours and that it is really challenging on a Thursday night when there are not enough restaurants open. And we're very concerned about this as the um, 
The tourist train starts up in August. It's going to run from August through November. They're going to be here Sunday and Monday and uh, Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, and on Sunday and Monday nights, um, we need to have stores and restaurants open, and those are not necessarily great nights for that. Um, a real challenge that we're hearing from the business community is they cannot find employees. And so um, we've got restaurant owners who are working, you know, several nights in a row, several shifts, and they simply um, have no capacity. So um, there is a virtual job fair going on where uh, the, and the chamber is doing a lot of outreach and programming related to this, um, but um, uh, employee shortage is uh, a very big part of the problem. Um, and on the food cart, um, there were some specific things that happened on Thursday night and uh, Agnes's husband was out of town that night. And so uh, generally she's there often, um, but that was a kind of a, just a, a tough day for her. Just so. my timing, I guess. Yep, just your timing. Just my timing, fair yes. enough. And I understand. I totally no, no, understand no but I, I, I do want to provide some context for it because it's something we've talked a lot about and it's a really big problem um, is getting staffing. And that's nationally. Yeah, right. Charlie, please. I, Laura said most of the things that I was going to comment on. I think, you know, a year ago before COVID hit, Laura and I were planning to uh, some sessions with downtown merchants to gave it open on Friday and Saturday nights, you know, when most of our, when our highest tourist populations here in the summer and uh, that, you know, collapsed because of COVID. Um, and we're starting to look at getting out now, but not only do we have the restaurants and the hotels having trouble with staffing, but a lot of these retail businesses are, are mom and pop and they get there at eight o'clock in the morning or 8 30 and then they're leaving you know at, at 5 or 5 30 they've had a full day and if you understand it'll eight or nine o'clock at night we have to convince them there's enough um business that'll be there for them to hire somebody so they can find somebody but we're, we are working on that mark it's something that laura and i've been talking about and we're trying to energize that as much as we can for a number of reasons including the rocky rocky mountain area um, right absolutely no that's great christian please Thank you, Marco. First off, uh, I would I really like the idea of uh, uh, the chairs getting together and sharing the ideas from the receptive board. So, uh, Marco, happy to do that. Um, we will collect uh, some thoughts from the DDA. Um, I wanted to talk quickly, just to hopefully help uh, shed light to uh, P and Z uh, about really how dire the staffing problem is right now. I mean, truly it's a national problem, but really it's hitting us here as a local problem and it's compounded by uh, the rapid increase in housing prices again. Um, there is no affordable, attainable housing for workers. Um, you know, wages, uh, we've all been raising our wages to try to entice people um, and to maybe get people to not uh, commute up to Aspen when they're living in Rifle or, or uh, Newcastle. Um, so, you know, we've been doing things like that, but as a community, we are really uh, suffering with trying to get employees. Um, so anything you can do to get the word out to, you know, teenage kids about getting their first job, you know, college kids getting, you know, having a job when they're not in school or on the days they're not in school uh, would really help the whole community. Um, the Rocky Mountaineer group is really important that it goes well. Um, they're looking at a 20 year contract with uh, uh, the railroad and they're looking at uh, almost being here six months out of the year, um, four days a week and renting 300 rooms. Um, so, you know, they're, they're talking about bringing, I think it's 600 people a night in future years. And, you know, we need to find a place to, to feed these people and pick their pockets with having vibrant retail stores where they can go shopping and have great memories of Glenwood Springs. But, um, you know, working into this whole vibrancy of downtown is this whole mixed use and that there being some residential components on upper floors. Um, uh, Sumner, I like, you know, the ideas about allowing some higher buildings with setbacks when you get to upper floors. I think those are all 
great ideas and great concepts, but uh, just wanted to share that insight. Thank you, Christian. And it's, yes, it, it's really hard to compete in the uh, retail or restaurant level with $35 labor construction jobs up in Aspen. It's, it's very hard, uh, I understand, um, to compete with that. So Sumner, please. Yeah, just a, a, a very old thought, Christian, that you triggered in my cobwebs. I'm talking way back in the 70s. I used to do, this was with eighth graders, so the labor laws were a little different. But we had the students put together a Glenwood employment guide for students. They went out to the retail businesses, found the job description. So perhaps reaching out to the high school in this case, and it could even be, it, it, it's a little, it may not be in time. Well, you do a two phase. We could do one immediately, but um, after the train later on, it could even be one of the students, um, senior projects, whatever they call them now, you know, their graduation projects to get them to go out and with your help, put together an employment guide for the kids. I don't know if that would help, but it sure makes sense. And it worked in the past a long time ago. Hey, we're looking for all ideas. And, and uh, you know, I'm speaking here as the voice of all of the uh, restaurants, retail uh, attractions. Uh, we're all in the same boat and we're all fighting uh, against the same current. So any ideas are good ideas at this point. That sounds great. I think this was a great discussion. If uh, anybody else has something to add, um, I'm just gonna throw something out there. And I, I thought this was interesting how this discussion went. Uh, we started out with uh, re losing retail on Grand Avenue and how to prevent that. And we ended up with event planning. Um, and labor shortage and all that kind of stuff. So I think uh, at some point commission, I'm talking uh, P and Z commission, we need to figure out how to address the A and B bank situations. Uh, we, we need to just throw out there, okay, no more surface parking lots on Grand Avenue. Should we extend it out a block to a Colorado and Blake? Um, if you pull out retail, you have to replace it. Or if you build a new building, uh, on an empty lot on a surface parking lot, which would be fantastic. We have way too many. You should be required to do a little bit of retail and uh, mixed use. I understand financing is tough, but hopefully that'll change. Um, so uh, I would like to hear from the PNZ um, just some other ideas on how to prevent the A and B bank. Um, and then we'll go over to the DDA and everybody gets a uh, a final thought and uh, we'll go from there. So commission, please. Amber. I'm not sure how to prevent what you're asking, but I do think some instances, if you, we have to suffer through a surface parking lot, let's say the collaboration between Bank of Colorado and the theater. So you can have mixed uses. So during the day you have one population, during the evening you have another, it does serve a dual purpose. I understand that, but wouldn't it be nice if instead of looking at a surface parking lot, you're looking at some storefronts and the parking would be behind it. I for sure agree with you, but if- Even with a shared, for, even with a shared situation. But if we have to suffer through the surface parking lots that we already have, it would be nice to maybe have a maybe a more collaborative. Right. That's it. A, a shared use. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I get it. Commission, Schachter, Sumner, please. You're muted. Sorry, we've covered a lot. I can think of about a dozen things that we've discussed that affect the A and B situation. What I'm wondering is, and Jen can answer us, it, if we routed this through staff and then staff compiled it with a not then staff compiled it for the chairperson that way we avoid meetings and then it could be disseminated via staff would that be the next step and marco your needs would be met if we say hey planning and zoning is going to focus on a and b first ideas that if that affect planning and zoning we'll route those to staff we can throw in some event stuff um, and then Christian can do the same thing with DDA, maybe talking 
both A and B design and, and some event and somehow we can coordinate those two, but going through staff, we avoid a meeting. Is that correct, Jen? And that would be something we can do actionable right now, even before a another workshop. So are, are you saying homework? I'm saying homework very fast that within Home, homework the or or let me throw this out. It's May 10th. We got another meeting on the twenty on the twenty seventh. I understand it's a month out. How about an official workshop? I call a workshop the second week of June. That we as a commission, planning commission, discuss this and put our wish list down. I would I would I would urge both. I would urge that we do homework immediately. So we can get some consolidation and consensus, and that's what we bring to the work next workshop that you schedule. Okay, so um, Jen or Gretchen, please look at the calendar. We can do a, a, a doodle or not, or we can just say, hey, this is our workshop. And I wanna keep going every month with a workshop, um, one way or another. But uh, anyway, uh, Laura, please. I do think it would be nice to come to the workshop in June with some uh, specific, you know, things that we're going to talk about, um, so that we can start to make progress and and start to say, yes, that feels good. No, that doesn't feel good. Um, yes, you know, things that we want to move forward or, or or amend, so that we are, start to have some kind of concrete things that we can move forward, and we're not um, looping around and sort of abstract conversation, so. Okay, that sounds good. Anybody else? Final thoughts? I, I, I think I've said it for months now, I, I surface parking lots and grand are not my thing. Um, so being redundant here, that's okay. At least everybody heard it. Um, so we need to, we need to, yeah, let's do it. Send in your thoughts, uh, send in your wish list to staff, I guess, and then we'll, uh, we'll distribute from there. And uh, Christian, anytime, a um, few days from now, once we have some comments, uh, I'll be over, whatever you want to do. Let's chat. Sounds good to me. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so if, uh, if uh, nobody else's comments, I think everybody's good. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and uh, voicing your comments and questions and, and concerns. I think this is great. Uh, we need to do this more. Um, and, and in the same token, I would really uh, like to direct staff or at least talk to staff about possibly uh, doing some sort uh, of a c commission meeting. Uh, I know it might get a little convoluted and a little complicated, but I think it's important that some commissions talk to each other every once in a while. Um, this was great. Why can't we do this with other commissions? Um, or, or without us and other commissions talk together. Just just a, a conversation of, of what Glenwood needs and, and where we should go with this. So that's it. If that's it, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Hey Marco, I want to thank both commissions and all the people for all the time you put in. We appreciate it on council. We really do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night guys. Thank you. Thank you. Marco, can we get a five minute break? Oh, I was on, I was, I'm on Team Sumner. Team Sumner. All right. Sorry, Carl. Five minute recess. We'll be right back. Thanks.
hey marco yeah i echoed your sentiment about like surprise unavailability of food so this today i didn't i wasn't going to be able to leave my office for lunch and so i i'll often do crave car there is no food there's no crave car available on monday the tortilla is not open on monday no it's it's za pizza isn't open on monday it's a tragic monday situation out there wow and and that's one day the train's coming i guess but it's like yeah, wow I, it was really bad. I was like, oh, I guess I should. I don't usually work on Mondays in the office. I usually work from home, so I'll just eat here. But today I was like, God, this is a tragic food scenario if you're just. A- maybe maybe some of us just need to like see it. You know what I mean? They need to live through it and understand that money could be made, especially with this train thing. And maybe things will change a bit. Don't you think? I know the labor shortage is huge, but don't you think they'll respond to the train Regardless, I mean, I, if I, can't I was imagine, a business owner, downtown, I can't set up, but maybe if I, I was know. a business owner, I would I would put those extra hours in. There's no doubt, but I I know it's hard. Trust me, I I understand. I think every small business owner that I know has texted me like, "Hey, Amber, if you know anybody, we're hiring." <laughs> Send me that list. My two teenage daughters are looking. Oh, they get a big, and it's not even shitty. It's not even bad places. Like Treads is looking. Really? Jimmy John's is looking. Yeah. Oh, every place that you would probably, work, like even that I would consider working as like a grown adult. <laughs> what What's the age, what's the age um, requirement for kids to work in business these days? In a retail or something? 16? No, that's, that's too old. No wonder they don't have any work. I think it's. 15. Carl, no. Carl looks like he's trying to tell. Me. Yeah, no, I was going to say I think it. Um, if they're if they're 15, um, there's going to be some hour restrictions um, on them that they don't have at 16. Um, but otherwise, they're it's it's fairly fairly open. It's just the total number of hours per week that they are allowed to work. I think is um, lower than if you once you hit 16. Okay. Um, so, send your teenagers out there. It'll be like, send your teen and say, you know what? I want to make 20 bucks an hour and I bet they get it. <laughs> I'm not lying. Jimmy no, John's paid 21 for, for delivery. I'll go for that. Yeah. <laughs> you going back to work? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's, um, it's a good time to go out because as a teenager, you should be successful finding work right now, which isn't always, you know, like sometimes right. it can be tough, right? Right, right. You, you have to work pretty hard not to get a job. I just told them in a break. I said, if you guys don't get a job with the summer, it's on you. Not on like, yeah. They would hire anybody. Like, so they hire you. I don't know what dad's saying. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sometimes they listen. Sometimes they don't. Well, charge them some rent and see what happens, Mark. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, are we, are we back? Are we Ben again? Where's Ben? Here. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ben, for letting me know. <laughs> okay, welcome back to the uh, second half of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Still a special meeting, still May 10th. Uh, next workshop is discussion with city attorney regarding land use, quasi-judicial powers, and decision making. So we did, I'm, I'm just going to, Jen, usurp you for just a moment and say we did the fun stuff, that we did the planning part of your name just then. Now we're going to do the commission part of your name. Um, so that was all I just had to say. And I was just going to share my screen if that's okay. (laughs) It's all good. We need joy. (laughs) All right. Where's joy? Joy. We asked for this. Um, I think, I think with you guys, we can go through this fairly fast. This is mostly a refresher course. Um, but I do think you guys are looking at a lot of big applications Currently, um, I don't see that slowing down. And so um, I know it's something we talked about a couple of months ago, Marco, we were going to get done. And, and then we had some issues with not really anybody in attendance the last time we tried to do this. Um, so maybe your penance will be you just make them watch the recorded version instead of the live version. Sounds good. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. I think she's going to do the first bit of this. Okay, you guys can see my screen. Yes? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so there's the planning part, the fun planning part. I thought, you know, our faces are fuzzy, but if there's a, I thought we should get a good picture of us, you know, doing the zoom. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but also actual real planning in the real world as well. Um, so, uh, I think Carl, you may want to help me with this a little bit to, um, essentially that there is, um, that the state gives us this land use authority. And, um, so specifically that, this is the language that's seen in the Colorado Revised Statutes, and I don't necessarily need to go through it, but there are reasons that we do things the way that we do things, and it's because that we have this um, authority that's that's given through the state. And I don't know, Carl, if you wanted to add anything yeah, quickly. I would just add on to that a little bit, is that, so, um, you know, Fundamentally, what we do in the land use arena from a regulation standpoint is based in the police powers of the community, right? Those inherent powers to regulate the community that you are in. What's interesting is that in Colorado, um, really, you're the only body that is required to exist, right? Planning commissions are required to exist, um, you know, other than the elected officials. All of those other boards, commissions, whatever that you may run into, you talk to, those kinds of things you're the only one that is is a requirement of state statute as well as um, you know exercising that authority that is vested in the community to to establish its zoning rules its subdivision rules all those kinds of things so uh, from that standpoint you enjoy a unique place um, both statutorily and from the charter's perspective and from the state constitution's perspective um, and, and it puts you in a little bit different position than everybody else who hears things or talks about things in the community because of that. That's really all I had. So you, as you know, what, what generally you're dealing with is uh, the information that's in the land use code. So in our code, it's Title 70. Um, and the intent is to build the best um, built environment for the city. And so the, th the things that you're weighing when you're hearing an application are, you know, in service to these goals, you know, promoting orderly, efficient, and integrated development, a variety of housing and neighborhood types, um, that, you know, the, that the application is meeting the minimum standards for design and, and, you know, you have those bulk and area requirements that are kind of the you know, setbacks and height, but you also have the design piece as well. Um, and that you're also addressing um, natural hazards. So that's something that as we go through the, um, the master planning, the comp plan process, when we get to that, um, and Marco, you'll have plenty of time for all of the, uh, the workshops in the world when we're in the, in the comp plan, um, process, which hopefully we're going to get here, get to here soon. Um, so there may be some other homework coming up um, in terms of looking at the comprehensive plan and thinking, you know, highlighting what do we think is still relevant here? What do we think is not relevant, which I think is some of the work that needs to happen kind of on the front end. Um, but I started to say that the natural hazards piece is something that's required if we get the grant uh, from DOLA. So, you know, this is something, it's an area where we'll really need to take a look um, during the comp plan process. And then, um, you know, ensuring that it's equitable um, when we process. So usual and customary, we're not doing anything that's different for this application versus this application. We process the things the same way every time. Um, and that's super important. And I know you guys know, but you just, it's, a, it's something that we really are always working on in the planning department. You know, somebody asked me a question, I'm like, well, what did we do last time? How, you know, because those interpretations, we wanna make sure that we're doing it the same way every time. Um, because a lot of what you hear is a, a quasi judicial process. And so this is where Carl gets, you know, he wants us to be really, you know, in the pocket, making sure that we're doing this because, you know, what, that you're essentially kind of, sitting as judges. And so what you hear in the land use hearing is where you should hear everything, all of the testimony, um, and you should be considering it based on um, what 
and I was looking for the exact, you know, basis. Uh, you have to make your your decision based on the criteria. So I'll just go through these ones. Um, consider land use and other quasi-judicial matters only at the public hearing, um, remaining, remaining fair and balanced. So don't make up your mind before you're, you need to be have your mind open during the whole public hearing. Uh, don't participate if you have a financial or other personal interest. Um, don't make your decision on the basis of irrelevant or non-existing criteria. And then don't engage with one side or the other before the hearing. So, you know, I think what we always remind you is somebody comes up to you on the street and says, hey, I want to talk to you about X. Hey, can you please come to the, the public hearing? Because we want all of the commissioners to hear what you have to say. And, you know, we want the public to hear what you have to say as well, because uh, that is part of the process. So I know that's super hard. It's we I know that that's one of the hardest things we probably ask you to do. And um, we appreciate it's a small town and it's really hard and they're your friends and they want to ask you questions. And, you know, we're just so appreciative that you guys work so hard to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Carl, I should probably let you jump in here too. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think, um, I think when you think about what you're doing, the analogy that I think is best is that you are sitting in judgment of someone's property interests, right? And so if you think about what you would want in the courtroom, if you were, say, being tried for whatever you might have done um, for a, uh, you know, a, 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 a traffic violation, you were, you know, you were um, cited for, for reckless driving because you're 20 miles over the speed limit. And when you think about what you want to have happen in that courtroom, and around that proceeding for you, that's what you want to give to an applicant. And that goes to things like, you don't want the prosecutor talking in the back room to the judge about how he'd like the outcome of your trial to go. You don't want the judge making up kind of new rules because he doesn't like what you're wearing or the way you sat at the table or all of these other things, you want him or her to make that decision about your case based on the facts and the information in the record in front of you that you've been able to see as well as the other side has been able to see. And you want the law applied uniformly and fairly to you. And so it's, it's really the same thing when we're making decisions on land use applications. And it is difficult because it's a very complicated environment. There are lots of nuances. There are lots of things going on. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, you as the planning commission are sitting in judgment of this person's or entity's property rights. And you're rendering these decisions based on the law, which is the development code, right? And so it's very easy to get caught up in things that aren't in the code, especially when the public is testifying and talking about things they might want or things they don't like or things that don't exist inside of the code. And I think we just need to really always kind of focus ourselves on what, what is the decision-making box we have to work with um, because put yourself in that, you know, in that defendant's chair in a courtroom and that's where the applicant is in terms of wanting that fair hearing and, and wanting a fair outcome as well as the, as well as the public side on that, right? The other reason I'm such a stickler about all this is that my job isn't to have particular outcomes. It's to make sure the process is defensible all the way through so that whatever decision you render, it is defensible and it doesn't get overturned, um, not necessarily at the council level, but at, at the court level if we get sued on it, right? I want a defensible process and a clean record. And so every time we drift outside of that stuff, it starts creating the possibility that your ultimate decision can be undermined by somebody challenging it. And that's why the application of all of these things is so important along the way. Um, they become second nature to somebody like Marco who has done this for a very long time. But even there you will find, I'm gonna give you a hard time, Mr. Chairman, because I will find Marco saying, you know, I really don't like X. And you know what? I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but 
and and that's the thing is that we just have to like be cognizant of the fact that if I really don't like it, it's because it violates the code. It's not because I have a personal preference for pink instead of purple on the exterior of any downtown building, right? Which is always a struggle with Marco and his desire for <clears throat> pastels. <laughs> so anyway, really pastels, you got it. Anyway, moving <laughs> on to conflicts of interest. Um, and, and this one, the code is, um, is very specific about when you can appear in front of um, in front of the commission and you can't. And Ben just did a great job of going through how that process works. And it can be really awkward in a small town because like we own property and we do things and it's tough. Here's, you know, here's the one when you step aside from the pecuniary interest, the one that is um, the, probably the most difficult for us to deal with as individuals is when we feel really, really strongly about something um, for a variety of reasons, because it's a friend of ours, because it's not a friend of ours. Um, and, and I always, you know, if you find yourself saying, I absolutely have to sit for this application because I feel so passionately about it, or I don't trust the other commissioners to make the right decision, that's a pretty big red flag in your mind. It should go off that you maybe something's going on that you need to examine more closely about your interest in this particular application. Um, you guys are all super competent. You know what you're doing. Any five or six of you or seven of you um, with the alternates thrown in can make a good decision for the community, right? It's, it's those areas where you start feeling like you absolutely have to participate regardless of what you might know is a conflict or feels uncomfortable or whatever. I, over the years, I found planning commission is much better about stepping away than, than we run into with elected officials that, that feel a different kind of pressure to be engaged. Uh, so that's really it. You know, if you have a financial interest, don't, don't engage. If you got noticed, don't engage. If it's your best friend, don't engage. And there again, from my perspective, I don't know if you'll make a good decision or not if any of those things come up, but I know that the process can be challenged and certainly you are open to individually getting beat up for having sat on that application. Um, it's always easier to recuse yourself than it is to try to make the case for why you should have been on the application, right? Um, and then we have this whole, you know, you need to disclose it. Uh, it doesn't have to be in writing. You just need to tell us or tell the chairman that you have a conflict. You guys are great about doing this. And in fact, so does city council. I mean, we've never really have a, had a problem with the disclosure of conflicts. Um, it's just great to make it on the record and then recuse yourself. It's going to get a lot easier when we're in person again in July and you can just walk out of the room instead of like having to log off or turn your screen blank or whatever you're doing uh, on Zoom. So that's that. Do you want to handle this one, Jen? Uh, sure. I was just making sure I was <laughs> off mute. Um, so I think I just grabbed this from the Department of Local Affairs and their training, but, um, and I think we've been over this, but I'll just go through it again. You know, that you're making the decisions based on facts, um, that information is not the same thing as facts. Uh, so um, I think that's one of the hardest things that you probably do, that the weighing of the evidence is your responsibility. Um, you do not have to believe everything that you hear. Um, that's a hard one too. And then opinions without a factual basis um, are, you know, are without merit. Um, and that public sentiment is not a basis for decisions. So I think, you know, Carl's going to, over this. We, what we do is we try to set you up with all of the information about the specific codes. And we try to answer any questions that you have. We are certainly, if you have a question and you can get it to us ahead of time, what we will do is we'll make sure that everybody gets the answer because again, we want this is it to be considered in the public hearing and we want it to be part of the record. Um, but we also want you to have the information that you need to make the decision. Annexations, Carl, take it away. <laughs> so annexation, we don't do a ton of anymore because we're relatively landlocked. Um, I, and I'm going to be very careful because we do have a pending one, but um, we can talk a little bit about process. Um, annexations are unique because they are a legislative act um, as, as opposed to um, you making a decision underneath the, the development code or something like that, um, that, that ultimately when they get to council, rather they're a legislative act. Um, they can take place um, by a number of different ways. Um, the one that is pending, obviously there was a petition to annex to the city. Um, city owned lands can be annexed if they're contiguous. 
and lands can be annexed if they are surrounded by city property and the city can then, if they've been surrounded long enough, the city can then force that annexation. What makes the annexations uh, is always difficult for us to work with is this idea that once you, once you do a, what's called a resolution of substantial compliance at the council level, that's saying that they've met all the criteria, continuity, no, right number of signatures, landowners, all that kind of stuff. It's very formulaic. We have to set a hearing on that between 30 and 60 days from the date of that substantial, uh, that resolution of substan uh, substantial compliance. So we always do that after the planning process has started, right? You guys have been engaged in, in uh, a process for a while now. We still haven't put that on the, uh, the agenda for council to set an annexation hearing in front of council because I've got to know that it's moving forward because um, one of the quirks of the statute is at the council level is that if I set a hearing, I can't just continue it unless there is an hour of testimony. So once it's set, we pretty much have to act on it. And, and so that's why you will see us kind of juggling timelines in weird ways, right? Doesn't come up too much for you guys, very confusing to the city council why things happen in the order they do. Um, so, you know, the other thing that is, um, that annexations are unique in, particularly when they get to the council level, is, is where we start wheeling and dealing, if you will, a little more broadly. Because an annexation is a voluntary act, not a required act. You can't, somebody can't force their way into your community. Uh, you have the right to say no as the legislative body. Um, and so that's where council on an annexation has a lot of flexibility to negotiate for add-ons. And it may well be that you as the planning commission can make some recommendations on that, but you don't have the authority to actually negotiate the terms of that annexation agreement. Only the city council does. Um, the other thing that's unique about them being a legislative act is that they're subject to referendum, uh, uh, petition and referendum, referendum right? Um, there is a set statutory period where somebody can challenge an annexation and put it to a vote. So, um, that makes them a little, there again, they're being a legislative act, they tend to be a little messier than when we're just dealing with straight up quasi judicial matters um, that are kind of lock, stock, and barrel moving forward. So that's really it. Are you doing the zoning? zoning um, obviously, you guys deal with this all the time. Um, we have these, the the city is split into all of these zone districts um, and it's the primary tool that we use. Um, I didn't double check that this slide is still accurate, but 17 separate zone districts. Um, each district includes a list of permitted and special uses um, as well as the standards for lot sizes, building height, lot coverage, and building setback. So um, there are reasons that, that, and lots of thought process that went into these um, zones. And so, um, and, and we had the experience of kind of going through like what else might need to be when we were doing the, the update to the land use code without our code didn't have charts, didn't have all of these things. We had a lot of conversations about additional uses or um, definitions of uses where we didn't have definitions at all. And so um, you guys have spent a lot of time with this, but not everybody in the commission has. Um, and pretty soon here we'll open it up to questions that you have so we can we can circle back to that but as you know there are the types of uses the use by right um and then there's the special use permit and maybe carl can give a little just quick overview of special use review where you have a little bit more authority um but uh, where you can be reviewing some of the things like drop off times or hours of operation or um you know, specific, you know, is this the right use in this space kind of considerations? Yeah. And also um, there, then you could also do some limitations on that use if the particular site calls for something. And then obviously there's prohibited uses, but Carl, I'll let you go back to special yeah, uses. I think this is a good time to talk about kind of how I like to break these, these thoughts processes up is that when we're reviewing something that is a use by right, if they meet all of the, the requirements of that use in that location, all of the, you know, if there's design standards that go with it, or if there is just, you know, setback and height restrictions that go with it, 
those acts are what can be described described as ministerial, right? You you or I may not like it, but if it meets the requirements, we are obligated to approve, right? Because it meets the it meets the standards. Special use permits are a lot more flexible because they are discretionary acts based on um, they're not a use by right. They can't sue you and, and or sue the city and make it happen. Uh, and so you do have a lot more flexibility to make that use fit and be compatible with the neighborhood it's in and mitigate the impacts that it might have. Uh, that might be additional parking, that could be you know, additional landscaping, that could be hours of operations, a lot of those things that you guys have acted on. But that's the, you know, when we're talking about a special use permit, we have a lot more flexibility than we do when we're talking about use by rights that are not requesting any kind of discretionary act, but are, are only trying to hit all the, hit all the, the requirements. And if they do, then the outcome, you know, is, is going to be an approval. Whereas special use permits, discretionary act, a lot more flexibility. And at the end of the day, if you just don't find that there is a way to make it compatible or mitigate the, the impacts that are occurring as a result of that, that's a fair basis for a denial. Um, as opposed to, you know, even if there are impacts in a use by right, that probably is not a basis for a denial. The comprehensive plan, um, and I, I do think that um, probably in the next couple months, we will um, sort of assign that homework. So if you want to be read ahead, um, you know, this document is, it was um, done in 2011. There have been some technical updates that I, my understanding is that they were kind of just map technical updates um, based on projects um, in the like 2014 kind of range. So you know, the question is this, does this document still represent where the city wants to go and who it wants to be? And so that conversation is coming. Um, we, you know, we're still hopeful that we'll get the grant from the Department of Local Affairs. I do think city council really wants to do this either way. Um, obviously we'd love to have the support of the Department of Local Affairs. And this year was a really tough, you know, we we're budgeting 10% down. So, um, it, you know, may have to be in the next budget cycle, but um, we, we will have a, a process to go out and talk to people about what it is that, that they see. Um, and we, um, at least in our um, application uh, in for the, for our grant application, really want to focus on hard to reach populations when we do that. But uh Essentially, this document, as you know, because you you get to hear about it basically every meeting, um, is talking about you know what what are those goals? What do we want to do? And you know these are those kind of um, how do we achieve that? And you know there are also kind of these areas of opportunity that we have identified in the current comprehensive plan for redevelopment or kind of recasting those areas. So I think, you know, the, the mall is one, um, I think the Safeway is one um, where there's an opportunity for it to redevelop into something else. Um, and so that is one piece that as we look at this document again, what are those areas and what other kinds of things do we wanna emphasize? But it also talks about those other pieces that are kind of related to hazards and, um, you know, infrastructure. So how does it interplay with the water system, for example? Uh, so some of those, those questions are kind of dictated by this document as you consider land use applications. Transportation obviously is another big area um, and the um, preserving cultural resources and natural resources. So there's a lot of questions coming up about when you when you are part of the process to look at this document, what is relevant still and what needs to be changed? Um, but we, of course, look to this every time you're looking at a land use application. And so until it changes, it's the document that you have that's your master plan, basically. Um, Carl, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. No, um, you know, Colorado, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not, um, you know, comprehensive plans should be binding. Um, they're not. Um, a, 
small number of communities have voted to make them binding. Um, they tend to be much more broad-based policy guidance documents um, than they are, you know, codes, and so they're much harder to to administer. I do think council is committed to to funding a, a comprehensive plan study this year, um, and I think that has become increasingly important when we recognize. The changes that have occurred in town, I think the census is going to indicate that our population has gone up quite a bit. Um, demographics are changing. Um, you know, just the simple fact that it is so expensive, the way costs have exploded in town. I think there's going to be, I think this is going to be the interesting and the big work that you undertake this year, frankly, is going to be this comp plan update um, and, and, you know, kind of renewal, if you will. Where's Gretchen? <laughs> uh, I tease. Um, so site architectural plan review, we have some thresholds and this is something that was worked through during that re revision, um, redrafting of the land use code. So on the residential side, it's administrative one to eight dwelling units um, and less than 10,000 square feet of gross floor area and um, the essentially the, the mixed use component of both of those um, and then parking as a principal use or parking structure up to 25 vehicle spaces. Um, and then the um, planning commission has the, the review of any that the any applications that the director pushes up um, to you, um, like the A and B bank decision. Uh, and then those site and architectural plans that are nine to 24 units, at least 10,000 square feet, but not more than 30,000 square feet. And then essentially the mixed use kind of component of that as well. Um, and then a, a surface slot that's 26 spaces or more. Um, I know Marco, no surface slots, I heard you. Um, <laughs> uh, and then city council is the, the deciding body um, for the, those that are larger than that. But of course, if there was something that you wanted to, to push up to city council, you have the authority to do that as well. So uh, the one little nuance here is that there is um, a noticing requirement for five or more units. Um, so it's required to follow the public noticing procedures that it, you would for a larger application. Um, and then variance. Um, so this, I did put this together um, before you changed the design criteria. It was approved on first reading. Um, so city council will consider those changes to design uh, variance criteria at the next meeting. Um, but essentially the variance procedure is intended to provide limited relief from the requirements of the code where strict application of the code result in exceptional practical difficulty. So essentially, you know, I think if you keep seeing the same application over and over again, there's a problem with the code. There's not a problem with the variance criteria um, that if you're seeing the same application over and over and over again, and you, you get there and you wanna approve it, there's a problem with the way that the code is designed. So I just throw that out there. I know everybody doesn't love it, um, but you know what we want to do is make it. You know, if there is a problem with, I don't know, like the setback is is constantly a problem, then you know we need to make it usual and customary for the developer, probably rather than having them come through this process. And I don't know, Carl, if you wanted to. Yeah, no, uh, I was just going to write any other criteria. Um, or, this is, you know, variances are one of those processes that are that are discretionary. And there again, if you do if you do approve one, um, you have the ability to mitigate the impacts. Um, you know, I will I will confess that in my 25 year career of doing land use, I have probably seen three variances that really legitimately met the criteria in whatever jurisdiction I was I was working in, right? And in the other instances, we're kind of finding our way around um, code provisions that maybe don't fit the community anymore. And what I'm thinking of is like one of the best examples, and I don't know if you remember this, Marco, or not, when we 
Um, I think you would have been relatively new to the Planning Commission. We were having a whole series of front yard variants setbacks in the downtown um, because porches were were sticking, you know, I mean, some of the porches on uh, were out into the, you know, you'd look down the block and the house that they were trying to add on to or improve the front of uh, was set back farther than all of the neighbors because they were, you know, existing non-conforming. Um, and it really limited our ability to kind of create that walkable neighborhood feel that we were going for. And so we made a, a broad based change in the code at the time to allow that, you know, the average of kind of what was going on on, on your block. And that's a great example where it was an issue with the code, not with the, you know, it, it, it just was a, a lousy place to put people where they had to apply for a variance each time. And then we had to find a way around the criteria to allow them because it made total sense in the built environment. Um, I, I do think we're seeing less variances, but I will also say that because it is a complicated built environment, we're always going to see some. And that's just a, an example of um, a variance that was a setback one, I think. Um, yeah, I, I right. So if you wanted to do anything to the accessory building, like you want to make it an ADU or whatever, you're going to have to come through the variance process. And so I think we fixed this and Hannah is on, so maybe she can help me, but we did, I think, address this one because, you know, you're seeing it over and over again. That's another example where it's like, okay, well, clearly what we're doing isn't working. We need to fix it for what we want. Right. And that's actually, I think, the last slide, isn't it? Um, I think it is. Yep. Last so now we can take like questions. So. What? Yeah, I think we can hop out so we can see it. There we go. <laughs> Takes me a second. OK, excellent. Uh, Amber's had her hand up for, I don't know, half an hour. So oh, sorry, I just I had my question. So I thought I would just put my hand up while I was thinking of my question. All right. um, because we're such awesome community members, I have some questions about, uh, are we, I don't know the, how to phrase it. Do we have liability if let's say we've joined a Facebook group about a certain project or we're- You, you don't have liability, but I'm probably going to ask you to step away from that application. If, if it's a Facebook group about a very particular project, right, and it is an, and, and typically Facebook groups are advocacy groups one way or the other, you, you've kind of announced that you, um, even if you're thinking that you're doing it for the best of intentions of it, I just want to hear what the community is thinking. You, you've really already kind of violated the first premise of, of being an impartial um, decision maker on the evidence that is presented at the hearing because you're out there gathering your own set of evidence. Um, and listening to your own set of, of facts that perhaps the other side doesn't have the same kind of access to your ear. And so I would say that's probably not the thing that I would recommend you do. And social media is tough because you're gonna see those posts come up. And it's one thing to see the post in your feed. It's another one to actively be listed on a Facebook group associated with a project. Because I guarantee you, if you are, somebody is going to mention it probably to me um, that that exists and they're going to challenge your sitting on that application, particularly, and, and think about when this comes up, is when it is a tough application and we have a 4-3 vote. It, you know, if you are that swing vote, then I've got a problem in terms of defending that decision because it's, you know, it's really hard um, to, to say, yeah, it was an impartial process if you were a member of a Facebook group, either for or against a project, frankly, I, I don't care which. Carl, would you also avoid, regardless of joining the face group, that's Facebook group, that's clear, avoid any commenting at all on the, on the feed you get? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you, those comments, and you may have remembered a little bit of a kerfluffle over my mayor and your mayor making some comments. Oh, wait, that, I'm going to tease Jonathan and say that it happens like every other week. No, it doesn't. Um, he's, he's gotten a lot better. But, uh, you know, those things get read. The community sees this. Like, it, it is, um, we're in each other's back pockets all the time. So please don't comment. So, for example, let's say we are a member of a said Facebook group that we joined prior to this knowledge, but we have not commented. But we've been watching. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, here's here's the problem, I, I, that here's the struggle, right? Um, one, I'd prefer you, you know, step away from the Facebook group. Two, 
you know, you, you have to ask yourself, and I'm just going to ask you to like do a little soul searching. Um, ask yourself if the information you're seeing that is being fed into your feed by that Facebook group is impacting your decision making or your thought process regarding the application. If it is, then you probably have a problem. Right. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So, <laughs> and if we have that conversation offline because I, I really, I would rather have that one-on-one um, -on -one and work through the issue. Yeah, I'm just, I know that there's been like a couple different versions of this, like a couple different projects that have come through that it was like, I don't want to call out another commission, but any other commissioners, but I just don't know like where, where we're all at with it. So I just want to have a real Right. And that's why I was trying to be, and that's why I, um, it, it's, um, it's great. I see Joy's on now too, um, to just be really clear about that. Right. I mean, this is one of those areas where um, it is hard because you can't be both a community activist in the classic sense and also be on the commission and sit impartially. Um, and I, I will give Sumner a lot of credit for threading this needle for a lot of years. No, seriously, Sumner, because you have threaded it for a lot of years. You've been very involved in, in a number of things in the community. And you've also kind of raised your hand and said, I need to step away from this one because I'm too involved um, in my other role uh, or roles as a community activist. And so, you know, it, it, I'm not telling you you can't do those things. I'm just saying that you have to make a choice sometimes. Do I want to sit for this application or do I want to be an activist on this application? And I'm not telling you one is right or wrong. You just need to kind of make a choice. So, sorry. And we can do this okay. offline if we all need to, or, or if we have enough mass of people who need to hear this information, maybe we do. So if I feel like, let's say I'm a member of a Facebook group, but I feel like I can be impartial. That doesn't count. So I have to, so so now we have like- I, I was gonna say, I think that- here, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, what I would say is if you haven't commented at all, I, I really would like to have this conversation offline to tell you the truth, um, because this is, this is I'm going to drift into specific legal advice, and I don't want to do that on a publicly recorded. So let's, I'm tied up the next two days, um, but let's try to talk towards the end of the week. Monday. Monday. Probably Monday is best. Monday. Yeah. <laughs> next week. Next week. Next Sorry, week. Carl. <laughs> Jen and Deborah are very good about trying to protect the time that I say I'm going to be gone. Yeah. Any other questions? Can we make surface parking lots a special use? Downtown. Um, if we can make, um, I'm trying to think of a, of a good horse trade with you. If we can make putting out the trash a special use. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and I think they absolutely in the bigger picture, Marco. Um, the reason I wanted to hear what you guys all wanted to, to say tonight is that I think there is probably a smorgasbord of regulations that we can do to impact those things. And um, you know, I think that um, we, we may be approaching that point, right? We've aspenized enough that that the value of the property surface parking lots may not be the most valuable thing to have in downtown Glenwood anymore. Honestly, I think we're, you know, we're pushing that. Route. Gretchen, can you jump in? I think that surface parking lots as a principal use are a special, special use review. I've got parking structures for sure. Those we should not. I think it's that question of- Oh, <laughs> yep, yep, you're right. It says, it says parking is a principal use. Right. Special use across the board. Yeah, I think what Marco is unhappy about is that if I have a parking lot that is ancillary to my development. Right. Not they are parking. allowed. Yeah. They are, exactly. I'm sure they're allowed. And it, it's not even the building. You know, the building is the building. It's brick and it's black. Okay, whatever. It's what's next to it that is a waste. Of yeah. And it is the kind of the lowest use. Well, there, I mean, mini storage would be the next notch up, but right. I mean, the land values in downtown are, are huge right. and parking is not the highest and best use for property downtown. Never yeah. um, and I think that, you know and I mean? I think the other thing that the reality is, is that 
parking as a necessity is um, is going away, right? Like well, I, next few years. I mean, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow, but I mean, when we think about a planning right. horizon, um, and it, 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 you know, it's probably not going to be what it is today. Right. I agree. I will say that some banks, if it's a finance project, require parking. So it's just something to think about that. You know, there's a, a piece, there's a component that's not the land use piece that you know, is controlled by someone else. Um, so. But you just said it. It's, it. It is kind of the land use piece, isn't it? If we don't allow banks, then we don't have an issue with maybe parking lots in the well, downtown core. Well, there's zoning I, that allows certain things. No, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, being able to, especially as you move into something a little bit bigger, like if you're trying to finance, say, a hotel, mm. um, very difficult to do that without parking because the lenders will require the parking sure. as a component of the project. They, you know, that, because they know that that's how, that's what success is tied to. Right. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm going to use an example of that um, building a downtown from scratch, which is what we're doing in Silver Zone right now. We, we did an entire city block, um, kind of a, a, a brownfield redevelopment of a city block. And the only way, I mean, one, they, they did want some structured parking, but the only way to make the hotel work and the retail work and the residential work was to have that structured parking because, you know, even if we would have said, we, we don't care if you can park it, there again, the finance package required that it be parked. Um, and I completely and understand that. Spaces in the, in the garage that is a public garage, guarantee spaces in the garage for the, for the hotel use. Right. So. And I know structure parking is very expensive. I get it. But I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said we had we hit a certain um, price point per res for residential in this town and hopefully hopefully some larger, deeper pocket businesses are looking to locate here and maybe they can afford structure parking with their development. Yeah, and that would be, you know, that structure parking is probably the place where um, um, you see the use of things like a TIF most often used, right? As a piece of the puzzle um, to, you know, that's the piece that's very public. It's a very public amenity. So it's appropriate to use public funds for that um, as, a, as a way to, you know, um, uh, encourage development and offset some of the costs of development. So, And I'm, I hate to compare, but there's countries in the world that will never let you build anything unless you have structure parking. Yeah. Period. If you want a surface park, yeah, okay, good luck. Let's put a hundred spaces down below and you can build. Yeah, and I think that's, um, those places in the world have, have reached a land value that. Yes, happened. but we're, we're approaching. No, we are, I, I totally agree. And we're out of land. So but I, feel like, I feel like we're talking about surface parking and not quasi judicial hearings. I'm sorry. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that maybe we like uh, wrap up on the quasi judicial hearing thing and then oh, we can right. absolutely on. any other oh wait we have questions sorry about sorry I just yeah anyway uh, Carolyn I wanted to go over um, one of those slides there was an administrative site and architectural review there was a minor which we get to see all the time is was I reading that correctly that planning and zoning does not get to see any major site and architectural yeah, reviews. It, it, thresholds when you make a recommendation versus a final decision, right? So uh, the administrative one, Jen, is empowered to make that final decision. That next to the middle column was you are the final decision maker. And so if somebody doesn't like what you decided, then they have to appeal it to council, which is a different process than when um, you're in the third column and you guys see it and you make a recommendation to council instead of being the final decision maker. So council is the final decision maker. And if somebody were unhappy, then they would take us to court. Um, there that would be the appeal process. So that's all that saying. You see everything other than what Jen makes a decision on under her own authority. Everything else flows through you. It's just whether it's a final decision or it is a recommendation to council. Got it, thanks. And there are a couple of times where I have pushed up the decision to you. Um, because there was enough interest from the community that I felt like it deserved a public hearing. A great example of that is the A&B Bank building. 
Jen had the authority to make that decision. Good move, Jen. Is that also the case with uh, Ben's proposal, Jen? Yeah. So that's those are I think I'm very supportive of those decisions. Thank you. Yeah, I think Jen and the planning, the ComDev team makes it does a great job of kind of knowing when things are going to be uh, of enough community interest that they should be pushed up. Um, and there's uh, you will find a lot of um, directors who like to hold that authority very close instead of hat handing it off. And Jen does a great job handing it off. So I appreciate that. Very good. Amber. Sorry, I won't belabor this very much longer, but I just just for clarification purposes, Carl, if let's say, for example, tonight I've had community members talk to me about applications and I just say I. I can't comment, but I can. I, I think what you want to say is, is this, is that they're going to start into it. And if you find a, you know, you want to be polite about it and, and this is going to happen. And I recognize that. Yeah. And so they're, they're telling you their life story as to why they feel a particular way. And you say, you know, you know, Jen, can you, can you just stop for a second? Here's the deal is that your opinion is incredibly important to the decision that the entire planning commission is going to make. And the only way for me to be able to consider it and the planning commission to be able to, hear, to consider it is if you provide that testimony at the hearing or you provide some written comments, because it's incredibly important to us that our community's voices are heard. And I can't do that standing here on the street, but we can do that if you, if you provide that comment at the hearing. Joy. Sorry, I dipped out for a minute. Um, so I appreciate the clarification about us being um, an impartial body. I guess I'm just kind of struggling with the fact that if we are supposed to be utterly impartial, yet we're representatives of the community on the commission, I guess I just struggle with the purpose of why we exist if the code can be very straightforward and staff can make impartial decisions based off of the code. Um, I don't even know if I'm making sense, except that... Um, probably are. Okay, how do we balance that we are also community members trying to uphold the integrity of the decision making of the community with the fact that we're trying to be impartial and uphold the code, I guess. Right. May I call as a commission member and then you as an attorney? Yeah, go ahead, please, Sumner. We do wrestle with this joy all the time. And I think as Carl pointed out, we can't use somebody's opinion this fact and and there's a natural reluctance not always to agree with staff but there's an obligation i believe if you can support it to not agree with findings and there's where we have some leeway um they're all and now they're starting to show us alternate findings and that is code based um it is more objective so you can then go ahead and disagree or agree or turn down or vote not to recommend as long as you can come up with contrary fi or findings that support your position. And it's not letters to council. It's not word on the street. Hey, this is, here's what the code says. Here's what the comp plan says. My, I feel the findings are X, Y, Z, and therefore that's the basis for my decision. And that I think gives us way, and we're not even necessarily, we're not saying staff is wrong. We're saying, hey, our interpretation here to the leeway we're allowed is these findings are what apply and therefore here is my decision. And, and can I just jump in really quickly? Cause I'm, uh, sometimes I think you guys are afraid you're gonna hurt our feelings. And I really appreciate that. I promise our feelings are not hurt. If you have different findings, if you have a different interpretation and you can back it up and you can make those findings when you make the motion, you know, we're okay. We, I, I, a couple of times, I know, you, you know, I hear it a little bit from you guys, you, you feel bad. You're not hurting our feelings, I promise. 
not at all. And and so, you know, we like you um, at the staff level have looked at the information we have in front of us and made a recommendation, right? We haven't heard from the public yet. We haven't heard the, the applicant's presentation in, you know, in the land use hearing. Um, so that's where it's so important what you, you do and, and speaking specifically to, to Joy's point, that's really that role you have is that you are a place where the public can come and talk to you about it. And the reason I, I kind of describe the difference in ministerial and, and discretionary, right, is um, I, I've seen very few purely like everything was just perfectly to the code kind of applications. There's always gonna be something that requires a little bit of interpretation, a little bit of thought, even in, even in, a, in a use by right. And certainly when we're looking at, at um, special uses or changes in zoning or those kinds of things, the testimony of the neighborhood is incredibly important. And that's where you sit as um, the sounding board for the community and where your, um, you know, your thoughtfulness and your integrity in making that decision of going, okay, here is, here's the criteria, here are the facts that I have heard, both what staff has given me, what I've heard in this room tonight. And I find that, that you know, and some of that, what you heard, you might not find as credible, right? And you're like, okay, here's my finding. I, you know, this is what I heard tonight, and this is what I find. And Sumner is, is really pretty good because over the years, he's been the one who oftentimes offers um, or offered alternate findings. And, and that's really what he's doing, right? He's just applying his decision making uh, to the facts in front of him. And so uh, just like, you know, why is there a judge sitting in the courtroom if everybody just knew what the rules were, you could have, you know, a, an AI spit out a decision. Well, it's all the nuances that, that, you, that you see as you're going through that process. And that ties to what we were talking about with Amber as to why it's so important people come and talk to all of you or submit written comments to all of you because um, oftentimes they're very persuasive um, I, and, and on both sides of the, uh, of the ball. And I remember when I was first hired by the city way back when, and Andrew McGregor, the then community development director asked me what my job was. And I said, on the private side, my job is to make the worst thing you've ever seen or the worst thing I've ever seen, convince you it's the best thing you've ever done, right? Like, so, so that's why it's so important that you're there is because you're, you're that filter, right? Excellent. Any other questions? No, good. Any more comments? Just keep Sumner on mute. That's all I ask. Okay. I'm having a drink. You can do that. Can do that. <laughs> no problem. Well, excellent. I think uh, if I see no questions or anything else, then thank you very much. Was I was going to say thank you, Carl, for this. I, I, I haven't been, I've been on the commission now for a number of years and we haven't quite had this clarifying discussion. Joy, go back and listen to what you missed. Um, because it is, especially I think for, I don't, I don't know if I want to say especially, but being a hometown person with a lot of people having access to you, it's a real. It is so hard. It is really hard. You're juggling all the time. Like I, I, I am a big fan of the mask mandate because I have been able to glide through with a hoodie up through city market so much easier to get lunch. It's fantastic. Or just be grumpy like me. Nobody will approach you. <laughs> So anyway, um, I appreciate you guys taking the time. I really do. Um, thanks for thanks for doing this again. Uh, it's always good to hear it again. Uh, it's very informative, always. Okay, cool. So cool. Okay, excellent. Um, I think we have arrived at the end almost. Um, we're going to go through commissioner uh, comments quick. And we'll start with Sumner. I can't talk. Carl said I can't talk. <laughs> no, you can. No, I said. Clarify that we've agreed as quickly as possible. We didn't say a number of days to route our downtown A and B type solution ideas or priorities to staff as soon as possible. Not to Marco, to staff. Yes, definitely not to me, to, to staff. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Sumner. Uh, Commissioner White. Uh, just appreciate the training. Clearly I'm new to this and uh, thank you all for moving gracefully through my growing pains. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joy. Uh, Carolyn. Yeah, Joy, I'm with you. I, I, I've sort of got thrown into the fire and was learning along the way. I had signed a petition about A and B Bank on Facebook, and that's when I realized, oh, you can't do that. It, it displays a conflict of interest. So it's tricky, but the um, staff is always there to answer your questions. If you, you know, if you think you've stepped over, they're always really willing to um, to give you some guidance. And uh, one other note of sort of irony is the ANB Bank has approached the museum for some historic photos of the buildings that used to be there to hang on their walls in the bank. <laughs> oh, that's great. Irony. I love irony. Yeah, I'm going to charge them good. Yeah, really. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Carolyn. Ben. I think it was awesome. That's great training. I would love to rewatch it and re listen. And I like the clarification about the kind of existential question of why do we exist? I think it's good to talk about. Thank, Thank you. you. And yeah. Amber. Well, I'll be brief because I've really over probably stepped myself tonight, but I just want to commend you all because people keep asking me what it's like to be on this commission. And I keep saying, I believe that we have people who, and, and about us and council and any commission is that people have the best interest in Glenwood at heart. And I don't question anyone's integrity or anyone's motives. And I just, what a wonderful thing to be a part of when you're a hometown girl just trying to make sure her hometown stays awesome. And so I just, I just want to be on commending you all and staff for all of your hard work to keep us going. Thanks, Carl, for the training. And uh, so thanks, guys. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commission. Not much for me, thank you, as always. Um, always good to see you. Uh, hopefully we can move into City Hall here pretty quick. Looking forward to that, really looking forward to that. Um, Jen, any any updates, any comments? Still a full plate for the 27th? Yes, um, Gretchen, I don't know if you're able to just jump in. Uh, yeah, we've got, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got uh, Consideration of a land use for, or sorry, for a reuse of the Western Hotel. That would be 11 units, uh, multifamily units. We've got one sign variance. And then as far as I know, the BLD proposal for 300 units is still on the agenda. And then obviously the continuation of the annexation proposal. So it is quite a full, quite a full plate. It sure sounds that way. Sounds that way. Um, great, thank you for the update. I, I guess I do have maybe one more thing. And, 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 and I sound broken record. Please, let's do workshops. Not just comp plan, but other stuff too. Let's this was it. other stuff? Wasn't it other stuff? There's, there's <laughs> other stuff, but this is, you know, not a workshop. A workshop is where we sit and we chat and we just, you guys take notes. Hey, Marco, with the, at the next meeting, will the continuation be the first thing on the item, Gretchen, or how does that? Uh, Usually. Yeah, that, that's that been our policy for many, many years. So we'll address the annexation first. All the continuances first and then the new items. Correct. Yep, that's how it works. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.